to put us here as people. So together, we can make this uh, a very good BF forum. Literally, just want to tell you, BF forum 17, because we have done 17 of this monthly uh, forum since January 2021. So this is the number 17, timely because it's also the month of celebration in May in Sabah. And it's called Revival of Our Heritage, uh, Indigenous Heritage. And it's literally the word um, revival because some of us, or many of us in fact, feel that we might be losing our unique identity, not only in, in Sabah or Malaysia, but in the world. So we don't want to lose that. And one of the reasons why we are discussing this today and sharing with you some of the very, very um, imbued stories behind it, all make an, uh, part and parcel of how we are, who we are, and the fact that the team here are wearing our costumes. We want to show that we are part of this huge community. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I don't want to swap, speak too much anymore because it's. Um, I got a lot to say, um, partly because I'm quite old, but also because the wealth of experience that I want to share is, is quite a, a lot too. And I'm sure many of you here. So please, this is meant to be a, a kind of very natural way of doing things. It's not going to be very rigid. Hopefully every one of you have something to say or something to share as we go through the, the, um, the event. I'm hoping that when we get to about five o'clock or 4.30, we have time for Q&A. We, we're literally saying we need to give at least half an hour for everyone to get together and talk <coughs> and share your experience. Tell us about your story of your childhood and how you see that and how it enriches your very being of being a Kadazan or a Dusun or a Murut. So very much we want to share that. And through this forum, we are hoping that um, it will tell you a story, you want to get involved in it, and you want to say something even more tangible and something stronger. So please do and uh, join that. So, okay, I don't want to say too much more now because I think I just given some idea. So Ken, please come in and um, in introduce the forum, please. Ken is our Chief uh, Executive Officer for the Borneo Organization and Borneo Forum. He is based in London, but of course, his heart is always in Papar, uh, same as my heart is um, in Sabah and in Pinampang in particular, although I am based currently in, in Johor. So Ken, thank you. Over to you. <coughs> Kopi Vosian, so we have it, Songya, Dezu, Ngavi, Daiti. I will start in Karazan Dusun. Kyo. Zona Pong, a Ken, Dunstan, Kundaya, Mantad, Papar, Limbahau, Kyo. Lambahau, Limbahau, Naponga, Kampung, Lotanini, Ni, Papar, Baino, Naponga, Dewan Undangan Negri, Dune 27. Um, I hand it to Kongavi, Limbahau, Bogya. Um, Zona Ponga, uh, Kom hakano kozo di hominan di kundaya dasar kundaya kibarati dia zu kutun di tapi naiku di totuo Roger Dunstan kundaya who is one of the founders of KDCA KCA ya yeah. so koto dan ngabi bawa tiba tito kudi tito tuan papar ya kami among among kami campur campur do kerana zaman penampang Terima kasih semua. Saya Ken Dunstan Kundaya dari Papar Sabah Kampung Limbahau. Limbahau ada satu kampung kecil di Papar, tapi sekarang terkenal kerana dia ada satu Dewan Undangan Negeri N27. Um, saya sekarang berada di London. Uh, Kata berakang saya adalah uh, seorang peguam, kemudian pensyarah undang-undang, pembankan, dan kini sebagai peguam di Koprat di UK, sebuah syarikat uh, international di UK dan di Dubai dan Istanbul. Um, terima kasih karena sudi datang, sudi uh, menyertai Borneo Forum ke-17. Uh, sebenarnya kami sudah bermula pada penghujung 2020. Uh, ada tiga lagi forum yang kami sudah anjurkan, bercampur-campur banyak topik yang kami sudah uh, Sudah kami anjurkan, semua kami telah re- dirakamkan dan di- dimuat naikkan di uh, channel kami youtubecom forum Kemudian uh, muka Facebook kami adalah 
uh, facebook.com slash Borneo Forum. Uh, terima kasih. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm Ken Dunson Kundaya. I'm originally from uh, Kampung Limbahau, Sabah in, in, in Borneo. I grew up there. I am uh, I'm a, a lawyer by training. I used to be a lecturer in banking and as well now in corporate law with a company in UK. So we are very, very uh, proud that we are able to come together virtually. These are the things of stuff of dreams because usually to organize something like this, we have to spend enormous amount of time and, and resources and funds to organize a meeting like this. But now with the virtual reality, a virtual um, uh, Zoom and all that it is made possible. And that is where Bonnier Forum has been uh, very, very active for the last uh, two and a half years. So thank you, thank you very much. Very much so for the all our international guests, very, very welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you will find us speaking in various tongues, uh, but primarily we try to speak as well in English for the sake of everybody. Kepada yang di Indonesia, selamat datang. Ada juga kami akan berbahasa dalam uh, bahasa Indonesia kadang-kadang boleh juga lah sedikit-sedikit. Tapi harap boleh juga mengerti dalam mengikuti dalam bahasa Inggris. Selamat datang semua. Ada ada juga yang dari Kalimantan. Selamat datang. Diharapkan uh, ke depan kita boleh adakan juga anjurkan uh, pesta gawai ataupun pesta apa yang dari Kalimantan ya. Uh, ada juga pesta di Kalimantan boleh kita anjurkan juga. Kami ada menganjurkan dulu uh, satu forum melibatkan Sarawak dan Kalimantan juga dianjurkan oleh uh, uh, Richard. A vice president kita. So, terima kasih, terima kasih. Just to introduce you, myself is the vice president, the president of Bonnier Forum and Bonnier Organization. Uh, Mr. Richard Punai is the vice president and also the chief marketing officer of uh, Bonnier Forum and Bonnier Organization. And then we have Mr. Alan Dumong. Unfortunately, he's unwell and he's actually in hospital now. He's also our second vice president. And we have project directors. Uh, um, Boyd and also Simon, but Boyd is also our chief operating officer together with Alan co-joined. So this is our lineup. At the moment, we are really looking for more um, panels in our management team, especially our, our um, the ladies, especially. And uh, we are actually looking forward to include more people. At the moment, we are all guys at the moment. So. Thank you very much again. I'll hand over to Boyd to kickstart our forum. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ken. And thank you, everyone, for those who have just joined in. Very much welcome and hope you enjoy the, the sessions. Um, okay, thank you, Ken. I'd like to invite our first speaker, Gundohing Blasius Binjua, a well-known figure, very well respected, and of course, uh, one of our major historians. And we are very blessed that he is here and joining this and doing a presentation because very much we were looking forward to learning about his stories, the book that he's written, plus his background, the way he presents it and shows us to us um, earlier because we had a couple of pre-session forums uh, and Gundohing was very, very open, very, very great stories. Some of these stories I've never heard of and some of the language are very, very deep. And I know that my, my mom, my parents and grandparents know the language, but it's not easy to speak. So for us, um, later generations, if you like, not so easy, but we want to learn and we want to understand. And we are very happy, for example, that during in the several years now, since 2016, the KDCA, the Kadazandusun Cultural Association have been doing what's called um, Pertandingan is, which is about literally about our poems and um, the way we say things in our language. So that's really, really critical in terms of how we see this. So, good morning, Blasius. Um, we are very happy that you are here and we very much want you to start this. It's about your story is very, very good. And I think it's an eye opener for all of us here, including myself, because this is totally an amazing amount of stories that you put together. 
over the years and we want to we want you to share lah it so we have idea nai ha anong abdi to because it's very important so copy verse in the dia um please go ahead tohadan aku tohadan tapi nai dai nai sado sabong dat um itin ha kumanan the this is what i call the the 21st century um this is a presentation uh from the creation of the universe and man and will uh, lead us to the harvest festival and then from there on uh, i will uh, uh divert a little bit how our native customary laws or <coughs> the undang undang of the makama nak negri is derived from the inite of our uh, our forefathers or our bobohisan in the early days okay please proceed to next one please yeah this is a typical uh, inite which i got from uh, gundhain uh, ignatius buji uh, some 12 years ago and he has given me his permission to use this whenever there is a discussion on the night on the oh, people oh, of the karazan and uh, i just want to read or oh, you can read yourself but i like to uh, share here that this is how our bobohizan or bahong kitas a senior processes how uh, she introduces herself to kinaingan god that uh, she is indeed a bobohizan a tandu a lady of the kadazan okay and uh, this is from odo ginaya who lived somewhere around 1900 and the late that Justin Stimo had verified this and what the what it means when we say kadazan is actually just simply people so when we say we say kadazan kadazan membakut is people of the membakut is as simple as that and the icon that i have there is uh, odu bianti uh, gindai uh, ginda sorry She is the mother of the late uh, Dawsia Mojing of Mansapiat, and she is the seven. Uh, I mean, Dawsia Mojing is the seven descendant of a well-known warrior, Mansapiat. Next one, please. And uh, who is this uh, Odu Bianti? Odu Bianti is uh, related to our dear friend Richard Simon Punai. And who has given me the permission to use this wedding of his uh, uh, father and mother? Uh, this took place on the 13th of August, 1967. And this is the lady. This could be her last uh, performance in a wedding ritual. And uh, you can see the siung there, the hat, the karazan, typical karazan hat, uh, being placed on the two lovely couples. And they could be stepping on the stones. Uh, yes. Next one, please. That's Odo Bianti. And as I've said earlier, we are talking about, I'm sharing the creation of the universe and man. So I'll start with this except of the night uh, by courtesy of Reverend uh, Mojing, who is a uh, Mong, some uh, in UK, <clears throat> and uh, it is the real original text in Kadazan, and there is a translation also prepared by him. Uh, I have this taken from a group many years ago that called themselves a Classic Kadazan Group on Facebook, and it uh, it has uh, captivated my interest. When it says that tau o kupo o tuhun, ada o kupo o tuang, tau o kupo o kadazan, ada o kupo o kabian, tau o kupo tanga, ada o kupo tungtungan. I just read this one, and perhaps you 
could uh, read it yourself. And the translation is as simple as this one. Uh, let us make men, uh, let us create people, let us make the person race, let us create the commune race, let us make the race, let us create the Tambingon race. All are very deep language, vocabulary, it doesn't exist anymore, but some of the words are still uh, understandable by us, the young generation. Bless you. Yeah. Just to, to eject, uh, everyone, those who are not speaking, please mute yourself. Uh, Boyd and Richard, please mute mute them, please. Oh. Thank you. Okay. So right. can I proceed, please? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. And uh, please go to the next slide. And uh, the creation of the universe and man, or the man, as for as per the previous slide, uh, reminds us very much of the creation uh, in the Bible. It's in the Bible, and uh, in this slide, I am sharing uh, how uh, how the universe was perceived by the Bumbohizan, and that's how they have been, I assume, and I believe, I have reasons to believe that uh, they knew that there was this creation of the world, creation of Earth, creation of the universe. And it's similar to Genesis, Genesis in the Bible. The text of the, Bumbo, the Bumbohizan is uh, simply too deep for me to understand, but uh, what it means is that that was the situation at that time. Okay, next slide, please. And uh, this is another one, uh, uh, also telling us about the, <clears throat> the, the creation of the uh, universe. In this uh, slide, I use an illustration that much of what was our, our Earth, our planet Earth was what? Just water and air, that's all. So there was nothing. And uh, I've read this part of the Bible and it is say something like that. So that is simply amazing to me. And the more I read this one, the more I became curious about uh, the creation of the universe, man from the Kadazan perspective through the Bobohizans. Next one, please. And this is uh, specifically for the creation of uh, man. So you see what I have highlighted there, Tanak Kinusai, Tanak Maginondo. So the creation of man and uh, uh, woman. And in this case, uh, I, I want to, <clears throat> Assume, or it's it's not assumption, but this is a strong belief among the Kadazan, even before the arrival of Christianity. We know there is God, and there was this night to say that Kinaingan uh, created uh, uh, man and the earth. Next one, please. And. Uh, Now at this stage of the story of the princess's uh, prayer text, uh, this is a stage when uh, body planting season came. And Kinoingan uh, went to his uh, designated uh, paddy fields up in the hill and uh, he cleared the area for him to plant uh, paddy. Next one, please. And uh, Kinengan spoke to his partner. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, to my understanding, Kinengan is the creator and he can uh, speak in plural tense, not in singular, just like in the Bible. In the Bible, it says, let us make men. Oh. So in the Kadazan Unite, it is also like that. 
that instead of in plural, because we don't have this uh, plurality uh, term in Kazakhstan. So it is simplified as uh, Kinaigan spoke to his partner. There will be farming. We need seedlings for planting of paddy. Let us go and ask men, referring to the people that he has created, if they have stocks of paddy seeds. Next one, please. And then his uh, partner, uh, as it is mentioned in the in the night, Fumino uh, that uh, he asked God does not even have paddy seeds at the time. And uh, it seems unbelievable, unbelievable for Kinegan to go and uh, ask the people he created if they have the paddy seedlings. Next one, please. And so uh, <clears throat> the inite, the text of the prayer of the Bohizan, the priestesses, goes on to say that uh, <clears throat> Kinegan and Huminadun had a daughter and referred to as Penampuan. Next one, please. And Huminadun, while God was away in uh, searching for paddy seeds, um, she waited and waited for the return of Kinaingan. But uh, Kinaingan uh, appeared to uh, be nowhere and uh, not inside, uh, probably in her mind, God is not coming back anymore. Huminodun gave up hope for the homecoming of Kinaingan. She gave up hope. So Kinaingan to her is not coming. So Huminodun decided to take a decision on her own. Uh, she told her daughter, she took her daughter to be sacrificed as seedlings. And this is a common belief among the people of uh, Sabah, the native people of Sabah, uh, that uh, a lady, a woman, was sacrificed to become seedlings as tournament for, I mean, to save men from famine. Whom in other secret, we work out a scheme that made Panampuan to sleep. That's a story, a very popular story in the ancient days. And then uh, Panampuan, uh, the partner of Kinaingan, uh, uh, no, the daughter of uh, Huminadun was stabbed by her mother. Uh, she didn't even have any time to ask why she had to die. Next one, please. As soon as Penampuan died, the body parts turned into numerous types of food. And uh, if you ask any uh, Karazan, any natives in Sabah, they'll tell you that the body is so sacred. It's very, very sacred because it came from the various parts of a human being. That is uh, Penampuan. Next one, please. And uh, this is my illustration. Uh, I'm taking the coconuts uh, for, for an instance uh, while we have the party. But the coconut is uh, so glaring that uh, if you remove the husk of the coconut, giving you the shell, you will observe. You will, um, uh, first and foremost, you see these two eyes the nose and one small mouth there. And normally when we drink coconut uh, water, we normally uh, cut this part of the coconut to enjoy the coconut um, uh, water. Next one, please. So it looks like uh, very much like a human uh, skull, you know? And then at that time, just thinking and return home. He had no ceilings, of course. And uh, he looked up towards the hills that he had cleared early on. And to his big surprise, he was shocked. He had a shock of his life. Uh, the hills that he had cleared is now uh, full of paddy plants. 
And the best part of it was the paddy. The, 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 the paddy is ready for harvesting. As indicated in my uh, illustration, it's golden in color. Uh, it can be seen that uh, even these days, if you go to a paddy field, if you see a golden top of the paddy plant, it's ready for harvesting. It's fully ripe. It's uh, ready for harvesting. Next one, please. And then, uh, you know what happened? Kinaingan then started asking, investig investigating Huminodun, where his beloved daughter Punampuan was. Huminodun uh, tried to hide it, to deny the strange absence of the woman Punampuan. But uh, Huminodun finally admitted that she killed Punampuan. She killed her daughter. She killed the, the beloved daughter of Kinaingan. And uh, her parts of the body turned into paddy and other type of crops. Next one, please. And God, Kinaingan was furious. At the same time, he was saddened by the loss of his beloved daughter Punampuan. What he did was he took a ilang, a sword. We call it ilang locally, and started slashing all the uh, paddy plants that is now ready for harvesting. And uh, he was really furious. Uh, he didn't want to see the plan. He wanted his uh, beloved daughter back to life. Next one, please. Another my this is my just my illustration. I took it from somewhere, but it serves the purpose of explaining what this ignite means. So, um, one. Uh, told her father, and uh, this is the voice from the paddy fields. My father, Kinengan Kapunan, my father, calm down. She tried to calm down the uh, Kinengan. Take a rest for a while. Do not uh, be sad. I will always be at your side. Now that all food crops are part of my body, paddy is from my blood and flesh. This is very tragic, but very touching to me. I am not sure uh, the rest of the audience, how they feel about this one. Uh, please take care of the paddy for my soul and spirit, flesh and blood are with the paddy. And uh, this goes to say that uh, the Kalazan or the Dusun or any native in Sadba, please, uh, uh, the highest regards, the highest respect for paddy. Uh, if you go to a typical uh, native house while they're harvesting, even a drop, uh, a, just a single seed of the paddy drops on the ground. Uh, the woman, our elders will pick it up and make sure it is placed back into the proper place, into the, uh, into the basket where paddy is uh, collected because every bit of the paddy represents the soul, the flesh of a woman who has been sacrificed to save mankind from famine. Next one, please. And then after the sacrifice of Punapuan to save men from the great famine, Kinaingan and Huminadun decided to go back to heaven, to Himabo, Humebabo, which refers to, in the native uh, belief, it's uh, <coughs> seeking a boat on the sacred mountain of Mount Kinabalu. So we have this strong belief until among the, uh, the new generations that when we die, our soul, we'll go up to heaven and uh, we have to climb up Mount Kinabalu. And from Mount Kinabalu, we'll be in heaven from the earth. 
that's how uh, the, what the Karazan believe in spiritually. Next one, please. And then uh, before they went up to uh, heaven, that means Shibabo, Kinaingan uh, and Huminodun gave seven commandments to men. Uh, it's all there. You can read it for yourself. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the essence of these seven commandments is very simple, very basic, but it reminds me personally of the Ten Commandments in the Bible, which is handed to uh, our men. And uh, it's amazing, you know, our ancient people, our ancestors, know that those this Kinaingan and he created man, he created the earth, created the stars in the sky. And they went back to heaven. They went back to heaven. But they gave us this beautiful uh, uh, seven guidelines of life. Next one, please. And uh, I read from the book by uh, <coughs> George C. Woolley that uh, OKK Lojunga from Putatan, I think this uh, grand gentleman, may his uh, so rest in peace, uh, related, he is a very knowledgeable on the adat adat of the Karazan, the native customary laws of the Karazan in Putatan. And he related this verbally to one Pangiran Osman, bin Okike Pangiran Haji Uma, who is of Brunei descent. And this gentleman, this uh, Tabai, this Bruneian uh, gentleman, he recorded in Brunei, Malay. And later on, when uh, this uh, British officer, George C. Woolley, saw the document, he became very excited and very interested. He translated that into English. And that's why it is uh, the source the source or the beginning of our Adat Makamanak Negri. If you uh, go and read the uh, essence, the contents of Adat Makamanak Negri. Next one, please. And uh, there was a project one time uh, in which I was involved, and this one was initiated by the then Tansri Richard Malanjo, now Tun. And uh, he asked, I was uh, present in that gathering uh, that uh, since I have some idea about the Kadazan Adat and I have lived through uh, about the Kadazan Adat through the Inuit, uh, though uh, I am not knowledgeable, but he said basic knowledge is good enough. You can start, try and dig some more of our Kadazan Adat is the Adat. And I have searched, I took samples of the adat uh, from related by uh, OKK Lajunga. Uh, then the other one was a later version of the adat, is the adat uh, from Papar. So I had that uh, prepared and then I was invited to present it to these two professors from UITM uh, to be further research and with the hope, with the hope that it would be encoded into a, uh, into a complete uh, law for the natives in Sabah. And uh, that's it, that was a few years ago. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Then, uh, I am not very familiar about what these uh, festivals, the rituals of the Karazan, uh, but I opened the a Karazan Dictionary by Reverend Father Antonison. It was published in 1958. Uh, this book for information was uh, his manuscript. Uh, 
was actually burned by the Japanese uh, soldiers in Pinampang and uh, almost burned, but the Karazal woman from Tambunan took it and uh, kept it uh, in spite of the, uh, the, the danger of taking the uh, partially burnt uh, manuscript by Reverend Father Antonison. And later on, it was recovered in Tambunan and uh, returned to Father Antonison after the war. And it was printed in, uh, in Australia, in Canberra, uh, through the help of Colombo Plan, uh, through the Colombo Plan, and uh, printed by the government of Australia at the time. Next one, please. Uh, you have this one, Momongkos Mamagon abstinence. This is very interesting, ladies and gentlemen. In Sugut, uh, not many years ago, uh, we had this uh, practice. We dedicate one day uh, in a year where uh, the farmers are not allowed to go to the field, not to uh, pluck any green things not to dig the soil dedicated to earth nature dedicated to nature and then there was this also barrier for villagers to leave the village but if and uh, they are not allowed to return to uh, the village until sunset similarly uh, visitors into the village uh, i.e in sugud kampung sugud pinapang if we had visitors, they will not be allowed to leave until sunset. If they do that, if they leave before sunset, then they are bound to uh, give soget, I mean, to appease the spirits of the of the earth, for I mean, polluting the the, the paddy fields. Mamantas, uh, these are all strange to me actually. And come to the this one, the one only Magabao. Uh, it's there. It is the Kadazan Havasu. And it's documented, recorded uh, by Rev. Father Anthony Chan, though he's an European, but it's documented there. So that's why I took this as my source of material for our for sharing. Next one, please. Uh, this one, you this image is uh, very popular. You can see this anyway. It's Magabao. I believe this one is from uh, Putatan or Trawe or Monsapiat. Next one, please. Uh, this one is one slide. I put everything there, very compact, so that uh, you can read for yourself and how Kamatan came about in North Borneo during the days of the British colonial government. Um, in 1956, there was this uh, district chiefs and native chiefs conference in Bengko, Keningau, and there was this proposal, this motion by OKK Sermon, the grand uh, OKK Sermon, well-known figure in up in Keningau. And he said, Kadazan Harvest Festival. He said that it's documented. If you read Connie Lupang's uh, book, he says that it was called Kadazan Havas Festival, but that is not the point I'm saying. But he wanted the Magavau to be made a, a public holiday by the British colonial government. So it's not Malaysia yet. That was in 1956. And Donald Stevens, later to what was invited to the site of Kadazan in uh, Kampung Tuawan Pinampang. 1957. Later on, he became the vice chairman and appointed as advisor. But in 1958, ladies and gentlemen, Tun Fuad was, or rather, Donald Stevens was elected as chairman of the Society of Presence. So he had a platform to, uh, he had a platform to meet, uh, to discuss with the British colonial government. Uh, say, Okay, British colonial government, uh, we are the Karazans now, uh, we are the Dusuns now, we are the people of North Borneo, and our festival is uh, Kamatan. So, Okiki Solomon and Donald Steven brought up the motion 
to the British colonial government. And uh, it was approved. The British colonial government finally approved it in 1960. Next slide, please. Next slide. Scroll down, please. Uh, this is the gentleman I was talking about. We live a long age. Uh, Donald Stephen is uh, an unfortunate. I think he was just 50, what, 56. Too young, too young. Too young to die. But that is not our story. Next one, please. Uh, this one is a popular image. Uh, Harvest Festival of Pesta Kamatan was approved by the government on 9 May 1960, to be precise, and the first celebration for those who are uh, of my age, they have heard this, 30th June to 1st July, 1960 at the uh, St. Michael's School Padang in Pinampuang. And uh, it's also very interesting to, <clears throat> to note that the first Undung Adaw of the Kamatan, Undung Adaw of the Kamatan, 1960, was a lady from Dongawan by the name of Yong Mi Lang. Most of us from Sabah, they know uh, this story. And, uh, but I just flash it here to remind us the this is the first Undung Adaw. She is uh, Chinese, but Chinese in those days are uh, considered Sino Karazan, and the Chinese at that time they were proud to be uh, referred to as native. So they are proud of their culture, of their, uh, their, their ancestors, grand, great grandfathers, grandmother, and uh, she is fully attired in Karazan costume, and that's her. <laughs> it was a Nukonda of our Pesta Kamatan. Next one, please. Uh, if you are interested to read more about Kamatan, you have a lot of materials these days online or social media. It's all there. Uh, but I just want to invite, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, our audience to just take a few moments sometimes when after listening to my sharing, ponder on the following things which is to me very amazing and i cannot find the answer myself i need help uh, to understand it better so you are the right people to look at this one my questions are ladies and gentlemen always uh, are on the next slide please next slide i wonder how did the Kadazan ancestors our ancestors huh? not just the Kadazan through the Bobohizan processes and also the senior Bobohizan called Bahongkitas, come to know that there is God. We always, I, I mean, I can only say for myself, I grew up and I was taught that if you attend a Bobohizan uh, ritual, it's a sin. It's a sin to attend. And uh, because they teach you, uh, about black magic and uh, Satan. And how did you know? How do you know that there is God? And uh, this has prompted me to read this uh, Michael Morales Subinan's book. And in fact, Bobo is not believing God. And before they open their uh, petitions, they read the entire uh, text of the creation of the universe and man before they present their petition to God. That's what I understand. Simply amazing. Number two, ladies and gentlemen, as Kadazans, are we not from the same, uh, I mean, the first man and woman on earth, i.e. Adam and Eve, or our Muslim friends, Adam and Hawa, Are we? Uh, but even if Christianity had come just yesterday, I would still believe that we are created by God. Uh, who is the first man uh, on earth? 
without Christianity or without uh, Islam, I would uh, believe that there was a, the first man and the first woman. But without reading the, the text from the Inuit, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know who is Kinengan uh, and uh, Uminodun. It's older, ladies and gentlemen. You can read it for yourself. Next one, please. Number three, how is it that the ancient Kodazan knew about the creation of the universe and man, even without any kind of education or written records? You see, uh, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, the Inuit is all memorized, memorized, committed to the memory of the Bobohizan, passed down from uh, generation to generation. And there is a school as called Pongyaan to teach the Bobohizan by root. Can you imagine? There's no text. Or they, they have, or is it possible that they have their own script? Like the Chinese, like the Jawi, but lost it during the immigration, the migration from the cradle of civilization that is in the West. I will not mention the specific place because I grew up to believe that civilization started somewhere in the West. I've read another book written by a British officer during the colonial government. It says that the Kotabalut folklore tells of a story how a certain migratory native people lost their little script. In Kadazan, we call it Suat. Uh, what it means is Surat. Surat, the script. When they cross the Kadamayan River in Kutabalut, while heading for higher grounds, while heading for a new settlement, a safer place toward Nabahu. Nabahu here refers to Mount Kinabalu. Our beloved, our mighty, majestic uh, Mount Kinabalu now. Next one, please. And why are we the Karazans on this part of the world called island of Borneo? Why? You go around the globe, it seems to me that Borneo Island is the place where the people of the Dusun Nakadazans are found. How is it? Has it got to do with the biblical creation of the universe of man, the first man? Or are we here because of the great flood? I'm using this one uh, as an illustration, just to remind of those who have read the Bible and about the great ark of Noah. That's it. Uh, next one, please. Number five, ladies and gentlemen, when we speak different languages, now in Sabah, we speak different langu languages, uh, but some way, somehow they are identical. Is it because of the Tower of Babel? Uh, this is also in the Old Testament, also found, I think, in the sacred book of Quran, the Tower of Babel, how men tried to become uh, God tried to reach heaven and which did not please, did not please Kinaingan, God. So he said, okay, you will not go up that high. I will make your languages different. And then uh, they spoke different languages immediately. When uh, one uh, carpenter asked for a hammer, he might have uh, got something else. He might have an ax. So they couldn't understand. Next one, please. That was just an illustration. The Kadazans believe, the Kadazans believe in a code of life. Yeah, the Kadazans believe that there is this code of life uh, in the name of uh, now the, the seven commandments. They believe that even before Christianity, before uh, Islam came to the source of uh, Sabbath, uh, <clears throat> in this Bobohizan prayer, Kinaingan and Huminodun gave, uh, gave us the seven simple commandments, which are, in a sense, uh, the essence of the native customary laws. If you have time, please read 
the Makama Anak Negri, the latest one, the enacted by the government of Sabah. Are there similarities? I'm curious to know, are there similarities in the Ten Commandments of the Bible and the uh, Makama Anak Negri or the Seven Commandments given by Kinenga and Huminodun? Uh, I leave this to you, uh, my friends. Uh, you can find, you can research on your own, but I'm just give you, I'm just giving you the surface of what I have found. I find it very interesting. Next one, please. I think we are coming to the end of our presentation. Next one, please. Yeah, we are there. Thank you very much. And I wish everybody a very happy harvest festival. Peace to you all. Thank you. Okay, Katahodan. Um, very, very enlightening uh, for me even, because it's uh, a lot of wonderful stories there and this connection between the Bible potentially and, and with our heritage, very strong. And it's, you're right, it's the questions that need to be asked. Um, some of these will need to be asked. Now, maybe we don't know the answer, but um, it's quite interesting in terms of looking at a different point of view of how it, there is a connection with the Bible potentially, uh, possibly, and how we um, identify with our um, ancestors and our background. So there's a lot of, of things and a lot of stories there, I'm sure. As historians, uh, rather, um, historians in Sabah will want to know and how we can make this together. Because for me, a lot of the history in Malaysia tend to be politically connected. So I want to move away from that. And I think if we want to be really into this history idea, then we look deeper in that. Because that's very superficial to me. And we need to go deeper in that sense. So it's, it's a very am amazing story. And I I'm reading some of the things that we prepared. A lot of the stories, like Rabbi Nai was saying, is to do with word of mouth. It's never written in a lot of the indigenous languages, indigenous stories and cultural traditions were never written. And um, from that, I think it, it's such a beautiful thing that we have this and handed down and hopefully we don't lose it. So we are very happy that uh, Blasius and our other historians are keeping records of all these things. And it's very, very important for the future of of our race, if you like, and all the races that have such deep meaning uh, in our lives, because that makes it a story. Word of mouth also for, for me is, is also very, very nice because I remember my grandmother, my Moing, telling us stories before bedtime. This is our bedtime story. And literally we lie down with her in, in our bed and she tells a story. And I still remember many of those. And I think uh, Tindarama Rita has written some of those, which is great. And please read through those. And literally, it is about the the, the um, old stories in the past about birds, animals, and things. And it's imbued with some of the spiritual things, if you like, because it is very much in that kind of mold. But it's, it's all um, something that you read and to tell to the next generation. I remember it, and I'm trying to kind of decipher some of those things. But of course, today, when I read to my kids, to, to a cheer that you saw earlier, it's all about books. It's written down, and I read the book, and of course, he loves it. And when daddy read, um, reads that, and mommy reads that. It's also very important, but this is what I'm saying. One is written, and literally, it's written by Western writers, Enid Blyton, and uh, Roald Dahl and others, it, which is good as well, of course, but even better if we have our own stories written in our Kadazan language and spoken by us to our children. And it goes on like that and it's perpetuated through the ages. That would be wonderful. I'm looking forward to that. Now, I will, again, now I'm kind of fitting to me that I want to introduce to the next speaker, which is Tan Sri, Tabinay Tan Sri Bernadompo. In his title is Revival of Our Indigenous Mother Tongue which is exactly what I was talking about and what um, Abinay Blasius was talking about. And very suitable because here is something really magical. This guy, I say he, this guy, because he's also my cousin in, in, the, in our lineage, um, telling a story and a very, very strong mission in my view. 
about perpetuating and keeping our language, our mother tongue, because it's it will start to change. And because of time, and I think every one of us, our younger generations feel that we might be losing in some way, some parts of our language, or it's diluted because the strength of the national language is, which is important by the way, has made a difference to how we converse even at home. So we try to do that in some ways to, to ensure that our language, our native tongue stays intact and we can speak it to our kids and, and, and they can perpetuate that onwards. So it, it's a guide, Bernard is it's a guy that doesn't need introduction really, but I just want to say that uh, Tan Sri Bernard is one of Sabah's and Malaysia's prominent politicians. He was the 11th chief minister of Sabah. He held several ministerial positions in federal government, as I know already, and as well as in, in Sabah, of course. And of course, a t three terms uh, member of parliament for Pinampang, and before that, Ranau, I believe. And then recently, of course, Tansri was the Malaysian ambassador to the Holy See at the Vatican. So very strong accolade, sir. And um, I'm very much happy that you are here. And we are all very excited that you can you can come and share with us your knowledge. Hope you will see you on the And I, I leave it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you will see Boyd. First of all, I would like to um, thank the Boni Forum for giving me this opportunity to be with um, so many interesting personalities uh, coming up with a lot of information and ideas on um, what is going to be done to enrich the language and the culture in order that um, a Bornean culture uh, can survive the test of time. My uh, presentation comes in two parts. I've been working together with the KLF for a very long time, from even from the time when I started getting interested into the language issue. And uh, they've done a lot of work. And, um, for today, I've asked them to um, collect all the materials that um, I found necessary. And I think um, after that, um, I will have my own little piece on what I think uh, the way forward should be on this. So um, can you put on the slides then and um, let the narration come from the uh, KLF? This presentation is about some of the activities for the revival of our indigenous mother tongue. Why revival? In this era of modernization and development and globalization, indigenous communities became aware of the decline in the use of the mother tongue or the indigenous language, especially as more dominant languages enter its domain. Loss of mother tongue means loss of indigenous heritage, loss of ethnic identity. For the Karazan community, their main desire to address this concern is for the Karazan language to be taught in school. In this newspaper clipping, dated June 15, 1994, with the heading BDS to push for classes in school, started with Fresh efforts are being made to teach the Karazan Dusun language in Sabah schools. As over the years, there have been several efforts to get the Karazan language taught in schools. However, at that time, there was no provision for the Karazan language to be taught in public schools. A Karazan language center, KLC, was therefore set up to conduct private Karazan language classes and to create a Karazan language syllabus. Before the Karazan language classes began, a two-day Get to Know the Karazan Language workshop was held in August 1994. During the workshop, participants, preschool teachers, primary school teachers, were introduced to the linguistic aspect of the Karazan language, that is phonetics, phonology, and grammar. Here in this slide, Tansri Bernard speaking to the participants at the start of the first ever workshop on Get to Know the Kadazan Language. 
Preparation at KLC located in Donggongon, Penampang. The first Karazan language class session at KLC was held in October 1994, attended by 15 students for children aged between 7 to 14 years old who graduated a year later. After the first batch graduated, a second batch of 29 students attended the beginner's level and intermediate level 2 classes. The Kadazan language syllabus was developed and refined as the private Kadazan language classes progressed. Tansri Bernard, Kadazan MP, who was then a minister in the Prime Minister's Department, brought the request for the Kadazan language to be taught in Sabah schools to the deputy Prime Minister then and continually and consistently brought it to the attention of the then Federal Minister of Education, Datu Amar Dr. Sulaiman Dao. Meanwhile, on home ground, on 24 January 1995, an agreement, Perjanjian Por Istiharan Bahasa Karazan Dusun Sabagai Bahasa Rasmi, was signed by Karazan Dusun Cultural Association KDCA and United Sabah Dusun Association USTA, where it was agreed that the language to be taught in schools will be officially called Kadazan Dusun. In the same year, Parliament passed a new education bill which became Education Act 1996, replacing the Education Act 1961, allowing the Kadazan Dusun language to be taught as a pupil's own language, POL. Consequently, Directive was given by the Education Ministry to proceed with preparations to teach the Karazandusun language at a trial level. News clipping dated 1st April 1995, where the then Chief Minister Datu Saleh Tun Said announced that the federal government approves the teaching of Karazandusun in Sabah schools. Soon after, the Curriculum Development Center, Pusat Perkembangan Curriculum, PPK, was directed to assist the Sabah State Education Department, JPNS, to plan the Kadazan Dusun Language Syllabus. The Kadazan Dusun Language Syllabus was based on the Kadazan Language Syllabus created for the Kadazan Language classes conducted at KLC. The teaching and learning of Kadazan Dusun language in schools was then implemented by the Malaysian Ministry of Education until the present time. The Kadazan Language Centre was later known as Kadazan Dusun Language Centre and institutionalised as the Kadazan Dusun Language Foundation KLF. At the press conference for the launching of KLF, The pioneering board of trustees of KLF, which were taken after the launching of KLF on 20th of December 1997. Some newspaper clippings in conjunction with the launching of KLF. Tansri Bernard and the director of the education department, Datu Hasbola, visiting one of the first few schools teaching the Karazan Dusun language at uh, San Anthony Don Tozidon. Tansri Bernard, the pioneering chairman of KLF, visited the KLF office at Towering Industrial Center in Pinampang, pictured here with the CEO of KLF, Madam Rita Lasimba. Let's continue now with activities that support mother tongue education. Much of KLF's contribution has been in training on the linguistic aspect of the Karazan Dusun language. Before the trial teaching of Karazan Dusun in schools in 1997, up till the present time, KLF has been continuously providing trainings on the linguistic aspect of the Karazan Dusun language to teachers, potential teachers, as well as lecturers at local universities and teacher training institutes. For primary school teachers, KLF jointly organized a course, Kursus Pemantapan Tata Bahasa Karazan Dusun, together with JPNS.
training for secondary school teachers, a joint cooperation with the Curriculum Development Center to train teachers on the linguistic aspect of Karazandusun language. Karazandusun language class for UMS students. Linguistic training for Karazandusun language lecturers at IPGM for the program Persediaan Ijazah Sarjana Muda Perguruan PPISMP for the June 2012 intake. This is for the first batch of SPM students who took the BKD exams in 2011. At UPSI, where the Karazan Dusun language is offered as a minor program in the Faculty of Language and Communication beginning in December 2010. KLF assisted in the launching of the Kadazandusun Minor Program, which was officiated by Pansri Bernard on 30 September 2010. 20 students taking the Bachelor of Education in Malay Studies program became the first batch of OPSI students to take this minor program. Another activity is materials production workshops for BKD teachers. KLF provided the avenue and facilitated workshops on production of students' workbook, exam questions books, and primary school daily teaching plan for Kadazan Dusun language teachers at KLF. These materials will be used in primary and secondary schools throughout Sabah. Another activity, Kadazan Dusun Novel Writing Competition. The competition was aimed at increasing the current pool of reading materials in Karazan Dusun to support the teaching and learning of the Karazan Dusun language in schools and at institutes of higher learning. Karazan Dusun Overwriting Competition 1, Tansri Bernard pictured here with the main organizing committee and the participants. At the Karazan Dusun Overwriting Competition 2, and at the Karazan Dusun Novel Writing Competition 3. The fourth Karazan Dusun Novel Writing Competition, which culminates in the Tansri Bernard Literary Award this year, was held in conjunction with the International Mother Language Day on the 21st of February and had to be conducted via online after being postponed a few times due to the pandemic. The launching of the first ever Karazan Dusun language CD-ROM. Another activity for indigenous mother tongue revival is storytelling demonstrations and documentation. This slide is a KLF organized storytelling demonstrations by the elders in the community to show teachers and students the art of Karazan Dusun storytelling. KLF documented the demonstrations and disseminated the recordings to all schools teaching the Karazan Dusun language as reference materials for school children. A yearly storytelling competition for primary and secondary school students are carried out to complement the teaching and learning of the Karazan Dusun language in school. Another activity for the revival of our indigenous mother tongue is to conduct seminars and workshops on the importance of the mother tongue, such as Mother Tongue Use at Home campaign. Another activity is publications, which become our heritage in print. KLF serves as an avenue for the production of vernacular books as heritage in print for indigenous communities. Materials for publications can be sourced from writer's workshop, shell book production workshops, dictionary production seminars and workshops, identity marker workshops, translation of materials into Kadazan, and Kadazan flashcard app. Finally, for this presentation, 
preservation and documentation of oral arts, such as Mananong, Magaval, Monogit, Humius, Sugandoy, Kadazan traditional wedding ceremony. These are just some of the activities for the revival of our indigenous mother tongue, Kota Huadan. Kota Huadan. Kota Huadan of Gina. Katoda na ogina di berita di pindah pawa buzu di hori pindah kian aku do pokito do onu nangang zan na bisa munabai no so that shows um, what has been done um, over the years and I think um, it was appropriate that uh, it was going to be covered by the Kadazan um, Dusun Language Foundation I see Richard in my um, um, Screen. I mean, are you are you going to say something? Uh, go ahead, Tinaro. Okay, okay. I mean, go, go okay, ahead, Tan. Tan, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, now I think um, I would like to say that um, I have intended to um, start my presentation in. Um, recounting the many conversations I had with uh, Tansi Sulaiman Dowd, who was the Minister of Education at the time when the language was proposed to be a subject in school. And uh, later on, um, after I think about five discussions I had with him, I eventually decided that this is a time to go on. And you know what he said to me? He said, I'm approving this in order to save a Borneo culture. So I think it's a very opportune moment and a coincidence that I've been invited to, to speak um, on this Borneo Forum today on a subject that has started with Borneo culture. So thank you very much. And um, of course, um, I have done a little bit of um, reading since then when um, since um, Richard came to ask me. And so I did a little bit of reading and enriched my little understanding of uh, the world of languages. <laughs> so I have since found out that um, there are only 7,100 um, languages in the world uh, today. And out of that, uh, 3,000 actually, which is about maybe 40% of the um, 7,100 are, what do you call um, language that is uh, perhaps um, going to the dangerous territory. But of course, um, the UNESCO has um, found a way how to classify the various stages of vulnerability of all these languages. And I think um, they have called it, um, number one is um, vulnerable. Number two, definitely endangered. Number three, severely endangered. And number four, critically endangered. And number five, extinct. It ikwa ibos da kamutan da nadari da tong tiagak biti. Um, first of all, what is vulnerable? Vulnerable, according to the UNESCO, and I'm I'm quoting them verbatim. Yeah, the the vulnerable language is where most children speak the language, but may be restricted to certain domains. That means speaking in the homes, perhaps only among a small, small group and so on. And the second one is definitely endangered. This is where children no longer learn a language as a mother tongue in the house. And in the third scenario, you go on to a condition where it is um, severely endangered. That is, the language is spoken by my grandparents and older generations. And while the parent generation may understand it, they do not speak it to their children anymore or even among themselves. 
So that is severely endangered. Now, they come to critical phase, the critical endangered. The youngest speakers are grandparents like myself. And um, the older, and um, the older, older, the, 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 my, my, my generation, that's what it means. And they speak the language only partially and infrequently. But of course, in my case, I still um, uh, speak it uh, to um, a lot of contemporaries and um, it is uh, very much alive. So the last one, of course, is extinct. And there no, no, no more speakers left. Now, I think um, one of the languages that is reputed to um, be going that way at the moment is the Ainu language, which is um, a, a, tribal, a tribal group in Hokkaido in Japan. So they've only got one speaker left. You know, a few years ago, they had five speakers, but it's only one now. So that is the type of uh, language that is uh, extinct or going extinct. Now, certainly the classification begs the question, where is the Karazan Dusun today? And I think um, I have my own opinions and I think I'll give it to you. We are definitely not extinct. We are probably on the verge of getting endangered. My own assessment is that we have, um, for the moment, stayed um, the, the, the slippery slope, moving, moving fast, fast down the slippery slope into the endangered zone by actions taken by the community and, of course, um, taken uh, by the government. As you can see, that uh, it is now a uh, language that is taught in school. And the acceptance of, 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 of that, I think, does, does show that uh, we, we have been able to, to stem the flow of, uh, to stem the, 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 the flow of problems um, besetting uh, the language today. Now, how do we protect languages? And I think this, this is an important, important thing to, to um, look at today. The most um, common means um, used to protect language, uh, and again, I'm, 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 I'm quoting the, um, the, 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 the sources that are very much nearer to the United Nations, uh, cre are creating recorded and printing resources teaching and taking language classes, using digital and social media outlets, and insisting on speaking your native language. I hope I'm still on. Yes, yes. yes. Am, I, am I still on? I'm still on. Yes, yes. Very interesting. That's why everybody can shut up. Okay, 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 okay. Now. Very good. Now, on the first issue, the creating recorded and printed resources, I'm sure there's plenty um, at the moment. There have been recording and the printing initiatives taken by the community through government organizations, even um, the KLF, KDC, the KSS, as you can see from um, the presentation today, the USTA, the PACOS, and a host of other organizations and personalities have contributed um, towards um, recording and printing uh, resources. Um, I think Blasi um, Binjua has uh, given a, a very interesting narration today, and I think this is a very important and good example of the sort of things that keeps the language alive, that there is recording of uh, some aspects of community life and and how, how the community came into being and how the languages are going on. And I think that is, that is well and good. And Rita, of course, will be showing quite a um, little bit, I think, uh, of something that um, is important in order to um, keep up all those, um, um, what, what can I call uh, the, the repository of the um, language and, and the culture of the people. And I think this is very important. That is part of the um, part and parcel of keeping the language alive. And um, certainly, um, today I think we can hear um, Venita Lijuti uh, doing a rendition <laughs> of a beautiful Karadan song. And of course, this again is um, it's a, it's a treasure 
that is being kept and contribute towards um, uh, keeping the language and culture alive. And uh, of course, Josephine is uh, filming all of this and um, the recording of what you have in, in the proceedings today uh, by the, uh, the Borneo Forum will certainly work towards that. And uh, don't forget that um, we are on radio and television, um, we are in the newspapers and all this, and we have a very active, um, uh, what do you call, community life. Every year, there's a harvest festival, um, which is celebrated in, in the month of May, uh, culminating, of course, in the 30th and 31st, which is coming soon. Uh, but um, there you are, you have one, one month of festivities in which um, all aspects of the community are on display. And I think um, this is a very good um, way of, of preserving that the language and the, and the culture will remain. Now, the teaching and taking of um, language classes. Of course, this is um, ongoing. Uh, teaching is in the schools and all this, and we have gone into the school curriculum since um, 1997. Um, and we have uh, worked very hard um, in order to ensure that um, the language um, will go further, again, will get further recognition. And it is now in the universities, in two universities actually. And we are receiving graduates every year. Uh, every year there are graduates coming out of um, K, uh, PJ Kent um, in Tuaran, and of course, uh, UPSI uh, in uh, West Malaysia. So there you are, it's in the universities, in the schools. And I think uh, these uh, are some very good pointers into, uh, into us trying to save the language. Now, um, the other point that was um, listed as um, useful is the, use, the usage of digital and social media outlet. And I think um, for this, certainly we are, we, we are, we are on, the right, on the right foot. The Karatan diaspora, for example, is also in the loop now with our friends and the lockdowns and SOPs, uh, which have necessitated functions, meetings, are finding, are finding this new platform that we have. So the digital and social media outlet has presented a convenient opportunity uh, for us uh, to play our role in pres preserving the language. Now, the final one, of course, is um, to insist on um, speaking your, your native language. And I think um, this is not an easy task, easier said than done, but I've seen a lot of um, uh, friends who are able to do that. But perhaps um, what I can say is, is that um, perhaps um, there are something else that we can do. Uh, you see, um, in all these uh, competitions, for example, like the Udu Kana, the Q&A and all these, um, does show that um, some of our contestants are struggling in um, answering the questions in their, in their mother tongue, but that has to be done. And I think too that um, all the functions that are being done um, by the government or even by organizations where it relates to culture and language of the Kanadan uh, Dusun, I think um, they should all be emceed um, using the native language without any shame or without uh, without any any um, feeling of um, being being um, inconsiderate to the rest. I know that the Karaza Dusun community are people um, who are very considerate and uh, who are very polite and they do not want to offend uh, their, their friends who come, but perhaps do not know the language. But I think um, they probably want to learn it too. So uh, perhaps you would like to um, let them go home knowing a word or two of the Karazan language. So um, my plea is for those um, who are announcing uh, in uh, festivities and all these functions that let us, let us um, use the, the language. Now, there are some of the points, a couple more points that I wish to make before my, my time is up. And I think um, I've uh, consumed a bit more of that already. The work on the Karazan language to my mind is work in progress. A lot more things can be done, and uh, certainly with the help of all, uh, we can we can address some of the issues. One of the issues actually is the um, the dialects, the other dialects in the district of Penampang where I come from. 
uh, the, the dialect, dialect that is predominant, of course, is Tanga dialect. And uh, a lot of friends and um, parents have, um, have been saying that, um, why is it that the dialect is not used? And I think um, it is not a bad idea to have that used as a dialect. Um, there has been some symposium done at this, uh, even at UMS. And um, my view has been that um, it is not necessary to quarrel about it or to bring down um, the Bunduli one uh, uh, dialect as, a, as the language um, used for the Karazan Dusun language. But I think there's room for, for, for us to use the template that is already produced um, when the Karazan Dusun language using the Bunduli one dialect was formulated because um, it, is, it is all there. And uh, the only thing now is to do is to, um, to try and fit it into the Tanga dialect and present a proposal to the authorities for people's own language uh, to, be, um, to be used in school. And I think this is very important. I'll, I'll support that move and um, I'll certainly help in assisting towards um, getting, uh, uh, for example, the Tanga uh, dialect to be inside the curriculum of the school as, um, as another, another people's own language. But um, this has to come from the initiatives of local communities. Now, this goes towards um, all the other dialects, the beautiful dialects, for example, uh, like the Rungus, for example. I mean, we could go through uh, people's own language um, mode of, uh, of um, re requesting. And I think um, probably if it's a strong enough case, um, the, the education department will certainly look at it because um, if uh, there are 15 people, um, 15 parents asking for a language to be uh, taught in school, the, the education department is duty bound to ensure that it is uh, attended to. It is the same for the Murut language. The Murut language, by the way, is a language of its own. And um, I think um, there has been a move in a long time. I, I, I certainly have been helping them uh, trying to get um, the language um, in school. But of course, um, as before, there is always a problem of which dialect to use and all this, and what are the materials made available. So that is why um, when, Kel, when, when we started with the Karazan language uh, class, uh, that was um, how the, the formulation of the syllabus came about um, when we, we had that. So there is still uh, some, some work to be done, but I'm very confident that um, there can be something coming out of this. Now, um, I think I would like to take this platform that perhaps the best way for the preservation of um, for languages like ours, the, um, the indigenous language is for the country to adopt a trilingual policy. That means um, there should be three languages officially recognized in the country for the purposes of education and for the purposes of everything else. The national language, of course, is, is Malay. But I think um, uh, recognition for English and one other language, a mother tongue, which means uh, for among the, what I can see from the racial composition of Malaysia today, which means that the um, official languages for Malaysia should be Malay, English, and then you come to the vernacular tongues, which means um, maybe in the Indian language, probably Tamil, it's, by the way, the oldest language in the world. And I think, I think that's what I understand, the oldest language in the world, uh, Tamil. <laughs> and then, um, then, of course, uh, Mandarin. And then in the case of, um, from, from some maybe um, Karazan, Dusun, then um, Iban, and so on. So you have a, you have a three, a, a, a three lingual. So, so it's, it's um, is uh, the national language, English, and the mother tongue. So I think that that's probably the best way of um, uh, preserving this language. And I hope that um, we can um, work towards this. Now, the only thing that I have in, in mind now today is, um, is, a, is a move towards um, getting more recognition um, for the culture and the languages of, of, the, um, of the indigenous people of um, East Malaysia, that is Sabah, and Sarawak is um, for us to be recognized. You know, I didn't just say that uh, we are we are all uh, natives and all this in the constitution, for example, um, 
uh, what what they have been, what is described in the constitution uh, with regard to in fact when they talk about um, special rights and all this they talk about the Malay and the natives of Sabah and Sarawak and I take this seriously and I think what does it mean I think the um, the holiday for Kamatan and Gawai Dayak should now be made a public holiday nationally, not just in Sabah and Sarawak. Make us honest natives of this country. I think I think that is my 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 plea here. And um, I think that's about all I I I wish to to, to say. I'm certainly even happy to be in a company of this. Um, very big group of people in the diaspora is supportive of such um, uh, such a very 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 interesting and emotive issues um, like native rights and all this and i hope that um, the discussions today will provide impetus for further work in this area and i congratulate uh, the Bonio forum for taking a foray into all this um, of niceties of um, getting getting um, getting people talk about um, the, the good things about the culture and the language and uh, this certainly will add uh, the the flavor uh, for for Sabah and Sarawak as um, as partners in the Federation of Malaysia so that's all I have to say and um, finally uh, let me just um, wish everybody here in Sabah and to those who are Celebrating Gawai Dayak, Selamat Gawai Dayak, Gayu Guru Gaya Gerai Nyamai. Thank you very much. I was going to go to sing it. In a way, but hold on. Yeah, got to and thank you, Tansri, for your sharing. And it was a very nice sharing for everyone, us, every one of us for, uh, to listen here. And um, thank you so much for initiating also the, the KLF um, to ensure that our mother tongue is kept alive and kicking strong. And also initiating the classes school such as like um, the uh, uh, keeping to ensure that uh, our, our mother tongue uh, will not be will not gone just like that so we uh, i think it's best it's wise for every one of us to preserve our kadazan language especially speaking starting from home everything starts from home gun <laughs> yeah um okay now uh before i introduce our third speaker uh, may i ask everyone to turn on their videos uh, camera so we can take a group photo uh, for the purpose of sharing later on so may I ask Uncle Richard to take the photo, please? Perhaps Uncle uh, Ken or Simon also can take them. Thank you. Hey, uh, can everybody show themselves so I can take this brief uh, photograph? Uh, now, uh, it is my pleasure to invite uh, Puan Venita Lojuti uh, to give herself ready for her presentation while well, I simply brief a little bit about Auntie Venita. Um, Auntie Venita is a very well-known, is a well-known song, uh, songwriter, singer, and a recording artist. And her Kadazan songs are regularly on YouTube, Spotify, uh, Amazon Music, and on Sabah labels such as Pusaka. I'm sure some of you are, I'm sure a lot of us heard of uh, Pusaka, right? Uh, so she kindly shared her passion and ambition is to raise greater awareness and importance of our boss Kadazan today. So she will share with us her inspiring and exemplary on her topic of who am I, who am I boss Kadazan. So Auntie Venita is a mover and shaker here to share her songs and her beautiful and meaningful lyrics and her passion of Sabah's indigenous Yes, people. So, Auntie Venita, please go ahead. Um, Hello, Adan. Hazel. Uh, 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 for inviting me. 
to give a little bit a brief on my song about both Adnan. And then um, I'm going to share um, a screen. I have prepared uh, four, only four slides on the script of the song itself. Yeah, Boleka. Ole. Okay, can everybody see? Boleh kan? Yep. Boleh. Boleh nanti. Boleh. Now, um, okay. This is the cover of the apa ni, the single, uh, which called uh, Bos Kadazan, the Kadazan language. Okay. Now, um, uh, this is the lyric of the song. Okay. Uh, it says Bos Kadazan, Bos Dito Hinud which mean the Kadazan language is a polite language. Katamis ginavo songyan kongo. It suit your heart when you hear it spoken. He is so anodid vinoon, the only one in this earth. He is so anodid pomogunan, the only one in the whole world. Why I come out with this song, actually, I mean, before I write this song, I read this song during the pandemic time, you know, and my intention is only on uh, on the WhatsApp group, and there is a WhatsApp group called uh, Pabu Bos Kadazan, whereby all the elderly will talk about how they felt that this uh, Kadazan language is um, going, I uh, mean, diminishing. Man, they, it's 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 like um, going to um vanish in this world that's the feeling that i have i i, I can get from them that this that was kadazan this kadazan language is in in, dan uh, in danger and is vanishing from this earth that is why i come to this um all the words that come from their heart i put it in the song and then from this uh from this lyric the Kadazan language is a polite language. Of course, it's a polite language. Even if the Kadazan language sometimes, I mean, there is a harsh language in Kadazan also actually, but imagine yourself when uh, like uh, Tabinai Richard, Tabinai uh, Dunstan, I mean, uh, uh, Ken, who are far away from, uh, from, uh, uh, from Sabah. How if uh, suddenly you walk in a market in England, Suddenly, you heard someone speak in Kadazan. What would you? What would you do? You will run after them and you will ask them, "Where come? Where are you come from?" Right? Am I right, Richard? You will run to them because why? Because Kadazan language, you only can find it only one in this earth, the only one in this world, because you cannot find it anywhere else. That's why you can find it in 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 England, like Richard. But then. Um, surely the heart is still in Sabah. And if you find someone in England who speak Kadazan, you surely you will find, surely you will feel so happy that you find somebody there speaking Kadazan. Am I right? Yes. Right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that is why I said it's a polite language. It will suit your heart when you hear it. When you are, people in Sabah might don't really feel it. People in uh, Pinampang maybe didn't feel it. But when you are away from your home, you really feel it. Because I, I myself have been away in, from, from Sabah, only in Putrajaya. When, when, I, uh, uh, when I met my friend there, or uh, Kadazan people, it not, uh, even not Kadazan, even if only do soon, I can hear them speak. Like, I feel like, oh, there's somebody there, like uh, from my hometown, you know, from Sabah. So it's really make me feel very happy. Okay. Now the next uh, verse, that is, uh, the next verse is, Bos Kadazan, Bos Tinungkusan, meaning to say, the Kadazan language is our heritage, lang heritage language. Oiton di aki om di odu. It's the expression of our ancestors. Kadatoko mangai tagako means let not let us not lose it. Kadatoko mangai hiivai, let us not forget it. So 
since this Bos Kadazan is the only one in the world, the only one in this universe, meaning to say, uh, since it's come to our, uh, from our ancestor, it is the word of heritage. Uh, it's like um, something like, uh, if like uh, when you find one boy, one little boy can speak in Kadazan right now, what do you feel? You feel like, oh, tanakti panay mo bos kadazan doy na ikot no panay. You feel so happy. Oh, yes, in one ko kamo tay. Yes, in one panay. Ah, when satu one one boy or one girl, a little girl can speak in kadazan, you macam something like leap in your heart because the heritage language is spoken by a little little one. That is why the I can I put it in the song that. Let us not lose it because it is our heritage language. It is the expression of our ancestry. Oh, ito nga with Yaki or Biodo Toko. So, on si ko nung obos in bos kadazan. I mean, obos kung mantad tanak ng vitong nini ng ka. Okay? So, the chorus. The chorus goes like, Oh, doi oluo ginawo ko. Oh, how sad am I? I am. So ngian kongo di tanak bayno when I hear the young ones now, aw no di dio ho abazagan. They seldom use the Kadazan language. Aw abazagan mo bos Kadazan. The Kadazan language is very seldom spoken. So this is how I felt and how the elderly felt right now. That our children, our youngsters right now, I didn't say that they don't speak. They can speak actually. I believe that they can speak, but the thing is that they don't. Uh, they seldom want to use it. Only when their grandmother will say, uh, uh, "Isaac, nzo pa dogan mo iho pinggan." Okay, jadi yang bah dia cakap dia they can answer. They will understand, but they don't want to speak because uh, that's why I said um, uh, it's not that they don't want to speak. They don't want to use it. So it's a bit like a um, bit uh, make me sad that they don't want to like uh, uh, when you talk to them they will understand but they don't want to speak speak it back to you. Uh, okay, but uh, actually um, this is the expression that uh, I feel and then I, I feel in my heart and I of course I'm sure the all the elderly elderly people also right now also feel the same as what I feel. Okay, the last verse is um, Bos Kadazan, Bos di Togingo. The Kadazan language is a beautiful language. Kano po buo toko bayno. Let's promote its usage now. Nung atagak Bos the Kadazan, if the Kadazan language is lost, atagak ko intutunan tinaw do toko. Our ethnic identity marker will be lost. And it is true. This Kadazan language is very, very, um, very beautiful in, uh, language. Let me um, uh, share to you one moment when I was pregnant last time, and one el uh, one uh, inai, my auntie, uh, go and um, approach me and says, "Odoi dia vinita apa bagatan ko mazoditi?" She said, "I don't understand." What she meant, and I said, "Also, I've got auntie. Oh, auntie, pregnant so no poti, guy. You know, this. Then she said, 'Pregnant, I've got an no poti no. The blang the the more the meaning of I've got an is like you feel heavy, you feel heavy. Meaning to say they don't want to say to you that ah ah ah, bagontizan ko, you pregnant. It somehow it is a bit rude in Kadazan." Directly, you say, "Oh, magontizan ko no." They will say, "Oh, obawagatan ko." They said, so that makes me feel like really suit me, and it's so beautiful. Uh, 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 elderly people go and approach you using a polite word, saying that, "Oh, you feel heavy. There's something heavy you're carrying. You know, there is a care there. You know, that's why uh, I put in this song that this world." Uh, this Bos Kadazan is a very beautiful language. 
you know they have that beautiful metaphor when they speak to you when you come to an elderly when they speak really in the kadazan it is surely a, you will hear a very beautiful way of speaking of kadazan actually and that is why i like uh, all the youngsters now to promote the usage of kadazan this kadazan language and if this kadazan language is lost of course it will not lost actually in this world, but our identity will be lost. Nobody will uh, recognize us anymore. Uh, Sometimes like when you say that I am Kadazan, but the, the way people, if the identity is lost, the way people look at us is like, oh, dia Kadazan pun dia cakap, he will speak in uh, Malay, he will speak in English like that. But if we can speak in Kadazan, the identity is very, intact in, in and very uh, solid. Uh, it is solid being there, standing there. Okay, so uh, these are my, um, these are only my sharing on my song on Bosca Dazan. And actually I did compose one song. Uh, it is not out yet. Uh, I, I give the song to one uh, boy who really can speak in Kadazan. That's why I feel like I'm so happy to compose a song to him uh, by the name of Huguan Carlson uh, Ansibin Mojilis. The title of the song actually, Kano Mobos Kadazan, meaning to say, let us speak Kadazan. Whereby um, in that wording is that the expression of a child towards a friend, toward, uh, no, towards all of his friend, um, asking his friend to speak in Kadazan. And there's a, uh, there's a message in the song saying that, um, nung nabati au kasa, ay kadakosusa, nung au kadavot, I saw the hasa. Meaning to say, if you cannot speak it friendly, there is no wrong on it. Uh, if you like uh, feel, uh, cannot really speak it friendly, there is no uh, mean. Uh, don't feel. Um, don't feel. Uh, I mean, don't feel ashamed on it. Just speak. We just try. That is the message from the song. And there also in that particular song also, uh, I did emphasize on uh, the message to elderly. If we cannot speak friendly, please teach us. Please don't laugh at us. Just just teach us. Uh, that is the message. So um, uh, I think it will come out somewhere in June later on. Yeah, so uh, we were going to share it with all. Okay, so I think um, that's all my, uh, my sharing on my own song, Bos Kadazan. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Auntie Vanita. Uh, it was it's a very profound profound lyrics that you have there and it was an ex excellent sharing from you um I, i'm also constantly learning new and it's very true that who we are who we are uh, as a kadazan you know and how do we see ourselves in in the economic environmental social and governmental development of our ethnic city and of Sabah. So uh, these questions are so relevant as we revisit and perhaps search on, search on our own identity and standing, standing in the world. And perhaps some of this question can be answered uh, by the next speaker, Tindarama Anti Rita Lasimbang. Yeah, uh, Tindarama Ante Rita is the CEO of the Karazan Dusun Language uh, Foundation, a foundation established, if uh, I'm not mistaken, somewhere around uh, 1995. And um, an idea jointly developed by Tansri Bernard himself, Tindarama, and a few other prominent Karazan scholars. And First and foremost, uh, Auntie Rita is an educator, linguist, and an editor, and she has written numerous books, uh, including the English Malay Kadazan Dusun Beginners Dictionary, 
and on Kadazan Folker. And we are very happy to we are very happy to have uh, Tindarama here, and I can promise you, her presentation on will make you think much deeper and about our unique heritage and the urgency in preserving and revi reviving our mother tongue. And her topic today will be a monogit ceremony, a tribute to the good spirit in the paddy field. Tinorama Antirita, please go ahead. Okay, Katahuadan Hazel. And uh, Kopi Vasyan to everyone. Yeah, like uh, all the rest, I would say, first of all, I uh, would like to thank the organizers of the Forum 17. Congratulations here on 17, <laughs> inviting me to talk and share uh, about the Monogate ceremony. Share screen. Can you all see? Okay, yes, can you yes, see? Yes. Can Okay, good. Let's see. So, um, yeah, the Monogit ceremony, as um, title here is, is, is but a glimpse at, uh, for this presentation. And this is about the Monogit ceremony. Uh, this was conducted at Mamai Bujin's residence, uh, Kampung Kituau, Pinampang, uh, on uh, it's a three days, two night ceremony conducted uh, in January of 2007. And uh, this is a documentation project by, the, by KLF. And this is uh, sponsored by the US Ambassador's Fund for Cultural Preservation Grant, 2006. Um, as we all know, the also in uh, the Abang uh, Aka bless you uh, presentation. Yeah, the monogate ceremony uh, from our research. It's the second second lap in the ritual in the rice uh, planting cycle, and it's a Thanksgiving ceremony held after the harvest. Yeah, and it's held to appease the rice spirits, Mambazon, to watch over the growing rice plants in the rice fields. That's why uh, Richard aptly say it's a tribute. Yeah, so, so now I will uh, present, proceed with my presentation. And um, as I remembered it, it, it was uh, conducted, uh, well, how many, uh, quite some time ago, okay? Mm. So um, this is the arrival of the chief Bobo Hizan. Bobo Hizan, as we know, is our Kadazan female ritual specialist. And they are cultural experts in the Kadazan community who have the traditional knowledge and also the ability to um, conduct rituals and chants according to our Kadazan custom. I need to use this one. Okay, this is the first ritual um, and it's called Sumasad. Yeah, here, as you see, the, the Bobohizan, the chief Bobohizan. Let me see, put this up, I can't see. <laughs> okay, the chief Bobohizan, uh, this one Inai here, and this Inai, Nailuvinning. Um, She's reciting some prayers, and it's the prayers called Momo Uak before the yeast is sprinkled uh, over the rice. Then all the Baba Hizan are involved in this uh, beginning of the, the ritual. Okay, and then after that, they continue with transferring the, the, the yeasted rice or the rice as Nasasatan into a uh, sukat or a woven uh, measuring basket, which has been lined with uh, doing in, this one, doing in or the linear uh, fruticosa leaves. And then after that, some of the yeast, the rice, the yeasted rice was put in this um, 
a small ritual called tambahai. Okay, in the next ritual, many rituals here. So the, um, the next one is mamatang the gandang. For this one, for this ritual, um, at the start of the ritual, the chief Bobohizan requested for all the Bobohizan to first hand over their sinavang. Yeah, sinavang is the, the um, is comprising, comprising metal pieces. And, and this is the essential uh, ritual instrument of the Bobohizan. And then uh, the chief Bobohizan started the momosik or awakening of the sakazan. Sakazan means transport by hitting the drum, yeah, the drum, yeah? And she's starting to hit the drum. That's why this is called mamatang lo, the gandang. Then the next ritual is popobus, uh, popobus lo tambu. So first of all, uh, in a winnowing tray, kohintu, uh, rice is poured onto it. Then the tabu is prepared. This uh, the one on the plate. And what's a tabu? Tabu is compensation in the form of rice, banana bud, tontido, uh, lime skin, kohopis, not lemon, uh, kohopis, kohopis skin, and pickled fish, non som, uh, the white non som without the pangi. Okay. Then at the same time, while they're preparing that, the rest of the bobohizan, there are four of them. Perform the mengusang tuntu the sad and prepare the hamak and monis the tambahai. So many terminologies show how, how rich the language is. And as we all are aware of it, if we lose all this, we don't record it at least, then we lose everything. Yeah. Next. Okay, this is mengusang tuntu the hisad. It means splitting up tips of the young hisad. Or actually, hisad is the specific. A palm that we use for the sumazau. But here they also synonym hisa, they say, but actually they're using the coconut leaves. And, and this one, the hamak. Okay, hamak is a pickled fish. So preparing that. And then the and then the, the hamak is wrapped using a dao leaf, another kind of tree. So not just any, uh, not just any leaf, but it must be specific to, to a particular uh, ritual plant. This, this is a doubt plant. So the leaf that's uh, white at the, at the back of it. Huh? And then the other one, the, the tree that I mentioned, one is Moni's the tam, Tambahai ritual. What's that? You remember the Tambahai is that little ritual jar? And so uh, this uh, ritual is to, to wake it up, wake up that, tam, that tambahai that, that just now you, that they put the yeasted uh, rice. Okay, so um, see. after the Moni's the tambahai ritual, then the Babahizan organized themselves. There are four of them, Modsud, the Modsud ritual, and they decided who was going to take the task of. So for the monogate ceremony, there are five tasks and that required actually five bobohizan. But at this time, when we conducted the, this uh, ceremony, there were only four bobohizan who are qualified to conduct the ceremony. So for this one, uh, why, but why can it still be conducted by four? Is because, okay, for the Kosad one, the other world, uh, these are the places they need to go for. Uh, Dimpunan, the beginning of the world, come in the house. The fourth one is Danau, and the third one is Datad. But Danau and Datad, uh, the rice field and the house compound, because they are just adjacent to each other, it can be conducted by one Mabohiza. And so the decision was, here was the decision. So Inai Luvining, Inai Luvining the, the chief Mabohizan, she will do the going to the other world. And Inai Livonis, this one, she will do the beginning of the world. And then for the house, I mean, Inai Silip, this one is Inai Silip. And going to the, the, the Danau, the rice fields and the house compound, 
uh, that was conducted by Inaigo City, this one. Yeah? So that's how. So once they organize themselves, then they, they move on to the start. So after the decision was made, okay, there was a break time before the Madsud. So at this time, uh, all the Baba Hizan took the, the meal. And the guests also are invited to, to, to dance a sumazal, um, eat, makan, and minum lah. Yeah. Uh, so the Baba Hizan also taking a rest prior to the Madsud. So of course, we, the field team, also try to, to um, take a break, rest. It's a very, very, uh, very um, in, uh, interesting experience for, for us and team because we are able to uh, sleep near the Bobo Hizan. Very, very unique experience. Okay, so uh, uh, then the next, therefore the next ritual is the Matsud then, Matsud ritual. Uh, this is the Matsud ritual where the four Bobo Hizan are covered from head to toe with sarong. And uh, the ritual commenced from 2 a.m. right up to 5 a.m. Okay, uh, they, it must be finished within this uh, uh, time because of the, the way they are going, the other world. And during the, the, this ceremony, the monogate ceremony, yeah, this is where we can see um, uh, intergenerational transmission of indigenous knowledge in a small way, but we have, this is where we can uh, get the young people to participate in the traditional ceremony. And they are the gong, uh, gong beaters and drum beaters. And, um, and most of them are from uh, youths from a nearby village and they must be good drum beaters. Why? Because the, the, the drum, the music that the, the gong that is the power of the sakazan, the ship that's going to to sail to the destination, and um, and they said that the drum functions as the uh, in a vehicle. What's that? Um, uh, tubo, tubo, tubo. The drum is the tubo, so it has to be uh, has to be very clear and with a lot of energy. Put into it, and they have to to beat the, the the set from two to five. So that's a long a long time to do that, you know. But that's why they have to they are into the spirit. But it's good because that's the one that I can see um, where intergenerational transmission um, of knowledge, how uh, young people can be involved in in that. Okay, so um, then the monogate ceremony. After the Mutsud, it continued at 7 a.m. the next day. This is the second day now. Huh? And then the first thing in the morning, what they need to do was to go get the bondo and capturing the two pigs. Why I say the, the two pigs, is not just any two pigs. These two uh, pigs, when they're still piglets, they have been taken care, they have been put aside specifically for this ceremony. Yeah, it's, it's already pledged to this ceremony. So they will capture these two uh, pigs and they will go get the bondo. Uh, what's the bondo? Bondo, uh, that's a young bamboo plant, the, this, this shape, uh, this uh, maturity. And it is cut at the base and then later it's pla placed uh, near the house or against the house uh, by one of the Bobahizan. And why it's done this way is this is a symbol that the family uh, is for having, is holding a monogate ceremony. So the, the villagers will know that um, at this time, a ceremony, monogate ceremony is being conducted. So next, okay, these were the two pigs. This is Uncle uh, Mamai um, Eugene. The two pigs were brought into the house, okay, into the house, the corner in the one in the in their living room, and placed in one corner there. And uh, this is where the the section of the house that the monogamy ceremony was being performed. So the bigger the bigger uh, pig was used for the house, and the myontong. Myontong is the um, 
Mo ji what sa miyan tong um <laughs> suddenly too much to kada zan i can't think my english doesn't come out uh, guidance um like a, what's that uh? like the archangel yum yum tong <laughs> and the other one the smaller one ah this is an offering for the spiritual world mm. okay so then once that's all prepared then you go to the next ritual and the next ritual is called gumandang what's the gumandang there's a gandang sound there okay gumandang okay is a uh, reciting two two chants called the ihong and the poin san okay while beating the the gumandang while beating the drum so it's called the gumandang and here uh, just um an apprentice lah uh, my cousin melvin uh, learning uh, from the four babohizan but as you see he had to write it in the book in the beginning when he's apprenticing so that he can recite uh, the the chants Okay. And then while the gumandang is being uh, carried out, at the same time, three chickens were slaughtered. Three chickens, huh? these are the three chickens, and the binabat and hoputan were being prepared. So what's the binabat? Okay. This is um, the binabat. This is neighbor, um, uncle uh, Sitaut, mamai Sitaut, preparing um, the bamboo strips from bamboo for making the binabat. And there are uh, 16 pieces of bam uh, bamboo strips are, uh, are needed. And then here in Naisilip, okay, the assistant Bobohisan, um, she's fixing the handle. So the, the six uh, bamboo strips are, are woven like that, one over the other. And then she's uh, fixing the handle and she's using um, young coconut leaves at the four corners of the binaba. Okay, and then hoputan, what's a hoputan? Hoputan, uh, uh, bamboo cannons. And this is the binaba here. Huh? So that's the bamboo cannons, the hoputan, and the binaba, and what else was being done just now? The, the, the three chickens, yeah, for this uh, ritual. Okay, so, uh, the, in the Gumandang ritual, the uh, after the chanting of the, the two chants, Ihung and Poinsan, all the Babahizan went outside the house. Then for the next ritual called Mindao ritual. Okay, so uh, the 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 chants for the Mindao ritual. Okay, they are one, two, three, four, four, four rituals. Batang, Dumamai, Mogundahok. And sumu pi dot tatabakan. Lots, kan? All right. So, okay, this one. So, in uh, the four um, uh, ritual, okay, Inai Gusiti performed the Batang ritual at the side of the house. So, once she uh, completed that, she joined the, the three other Bobohizans uh, sitting in a row. And um, my, my note here that before all the Bobohizan went out the house, one of the pigs and a chicken were prepared outside. So that's one of the pigs and the chicken, one of the three chickens. And let's go to the next one. And then here it is. So the four of them sitting here. So Inai Livonis here, she performed the Dumamai. All right. And Inai uh, uh, Gusiti, yeah, who had already performed the Batang ritual, she performed the Magundahok ritual. And then the two more, two more Bobohizan. Okay, then the chief Bobohizan, this chief Bobohizan, and her assistant, Inai Silip here, performed the Sumu Pida Tabakan ritual. And during this ritual, the assistant to the chief Bobohizan, she pierced the chicken head using a feather taken from its swing. And after piercing, the chief of Bohizan continued. The chief of Bohizan is the one who, who, who did the sumupi, the tabakan, the tabakan chan. The assistant performed the, the poking of the piercing, I mean, piercing the chicken head. Okay. 
done with that, the next ritual is called the magampa. The magampa ritual, it means this ritual is performed to, to take away, away any sickness or any form of illness or disease. Okay? So the chief Bobo Hizan here, she is uh, holding the uh, rooster, yeah, the rooster and a sword, a sword here. And her assistant holding a spear, that's a spear. And the other uh, Bobohizan, each holding the uh, tungkaba. This is a, a piece of bamboo with its, its end split. It's uh, not in the hole, but it has been uh, uh, splitted. And a sword. So they will uh, go around and while they can uh, hit the split bamboo. Some of you may have. Uh, taken part in this uh, magampa ritual, so you can um, understand uh, most of this. Then, so then one, once the magampa ritual is done, then the next ritual is the mundang. Okay, mundang, okay. What is uh, a mundang? First, um, uh, in the full version of this slide, there are all these, the offerings, but here, because it's only a glimpse, I heard that, after the offerings, the offerings were laid out, the mundang ritual then commenced. And this is a um, recitation of chants to invite the spirit guest. Yeah? The Baba Hizan chanted and performed the Sumazao, gong beating accompanied the ritual, and the Baba Hizan, uh, Inai Busiti and the apprentice uh, performed the Sumazao. And the next ritual is the Popobus the Hobutan. Okay, this is a really a very interesting ritual and very, very uh, rare. Uh, only once maybe in my whole life will I will ever see this because in Penampang, I don't know whether anybody would ever perform the monogate ceremony. Here you see the chief Bobohizan baiting the Hoputan, uh, the cannons. Paduan Bahaidao, Paduan, Paduan baiting with seven types of leaves and uh, these are all ritual plants, and the name of all these plants are already uh, nakasai. So, for instance, the Xora, that is the name in Kadazan is Tongkwasam, and Asam is cool. So, it's already connected to Asam. And then, if it's another one, is the like a boibi. Boibi means kobibi. So, it's already there's um, a sound, mitahos over there. The sound, it sounds like so. That is the seven, uh, two of the, the seven ritual plants huh? used in, in um, Kadazan uh, rituals. All right, so this one, so this is how they do the Popobus the Hoputan. All right, the Baba Hizan, um, they stood around Mamai Bujin. Mamai Bujin is the horse, he's the one uh, conducting the, his, home, his family is conducting the uh, monogis ceremony. So, he is attending to the, the bamboo cannons and um, um, he, is, he puts that over the fire. He uh, blow the fire to make it, uh, to make it until the bamboo cannons uh, explode. While the Baba Hizan all dance around him. And uh, in a video, you will actually see and feel the, the motion and in motion, but this is um, uh, just the uh, still still pictures, huh? so don't, but um, this is how it's done. It's the atmosphere is such that um, uh, you would really treasure it if ever take part in this ceremony. And so there are two um, the the two cannons, the two bamboos uh, represent two. One, the omen, kopizo. The other one is tuo gossips. So the the purpose of this Pobus the Hoputan is that their board must explode. So that um, if it explodes, means that uh, any bad omen will be driven away from the from the family who is conducting this uh, ritual. And uh, gossips also, there are lots of gossips, and that also need to be driven away. So the, the purpose of Pobus the Hoputan is to make the two cannons burst and, and expel all those uh, kopizo and gossip. And so uh, at that time, it was good lah, because 
both of the cannons exploded. And as I've said before, the motion and emotion and the, the, the atmosphere at that time, really it was that. Then the punkies, the victory cry punkies was done. And then, um, and also the sumaza was performed. It's like a, a happy moment because the, the, the objective of the popobus it exploded. So break all the bad uh, omen and the gossip. Next. Um, so the next ritual is Papa Sazao the Myeongtong. Okay, Papa Sazao the Myeongtong. Okay. Then the Chief Bobohizan and her assistant, uh, Chief Bobohizan, uh, perform the Papa Sazao the Myeongtong. And these are the paraphernalia for, for this uh, ritual. Next ritual is Mongotob the Binabat and Poposoku the Amok. Oh, that's too like the, the, this day. Lah. So, okay, while the chant to, uh, while the chant for taking down the Binabat, the Binabat that was hanged, there's chanting while it's been taken down, it's been re and then uh, there's a recitation. A horse got ready to Poposoku the Amok. He's, uh, this is spear, Amok is the arrow, instead, uh, or dart. So uh, shooting the dart using a blowpipe, huh? blowpipe. And there were two darts. Okay. One for good, good, goodness, good, Hovosian, and the other one for Kalatan, evil. So he will um, blow, shoot that dart away for one to get goodness and the other one to also expel evil. So as the binabat was being taken down or being cut uh, from where it's hung, the shooting of the dart was performed. And then the, uh, first of all, he, uh, the kalatan, the um, evil amok dart was blown off first, followed by the Ovasian dart. And then that was that. And the last day of the monogit, this is the second night, eh? Okay, the last night, uh, the first night, uh, Monsoot, this is the second night, um, is they perform again the Monsoot ceremony, right? And then um, after that, the, here you, you see the chief Bobohizan communicating with the Myeongtong. Okay, here I have the keeper, keeper, eh? Myeongtong, the keeper of the family. Uh, who requested for the monarchy ceremony. So they are um, communicating with the Myeongtong. Then, okay, so after the Modsut ritual and after breakfast, the assistant to the chief Ubohizan attended to the tubu. You also remember what the tubu is? And then the bonduk, this is, you remember, this is the bamboo and the sakazan. Okay, the tubu was cut off and sent home. The bonduk was also taken down. And the Sakazano transport was sent back to port. Then, after that, the compensation for the Bobohizan service was divided. Yeah, okay. So this one, uh, the Bobohizan scaling the paddy, and how they uh, divide that is according to the rank and service during the monogate ceremony. Uh, the, um, service and rank. Service is like where they, you know, the, the five places then they need to the task that was divided. So that's the, the service. Oh, and with that, that's the end because it's only a glimpse. There are so much more. Um, you can imagine this is a uh, three days, uh, two nights. So you count the hours. I know it's like 78 hours of recording, uh, more than 2,000 over uh, uh, photographs. Okay, it's, uh, I will what, stop share. All right, and we're back to the main group. Patahuadan, so over to you, uh, Hazel. Okay, thank you very much. Patahuadan, Rita, oh, that was- Oh, voice, okay. It, it's, um, it's a bit lengthy, but of course, it's very important to, to realize there's so much in there. And especially for us, for the older, the younger generation rather, it's something that um, they need to know because I've been through that. I've been under that, for example, and I was um, quite, uh, I think maybe nine, eight, nine years old under that 
um, covering. But and it used to be very scary. For me, it's so scary. <laughs> and, and like, um, I, I don't want to get um, get caught in that. And you're talking about the the um, the transport. I I know that it. I went. I've observed that, and saw how it's done. And it's it's performed in such a way because you need the robots that need to stay in the boat if they're going to the other world. Otherwise, if you go down into the ground on that, they might not be able to come back. That's why it's important to have the others in the other robots and on that. So, but it's it, it's a it's a, a group of um, very special priestesses that um, we are losing, and and partly maybe because it's. Um, it's a very ancient language, very, 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 very full of traditions. And it's something that um, needs to be recorded and bring to the fore, if you like. So we need to keep that in mind. I just wanted to say before Hazel comes back is the fact that Rita and I knew each other literally 20 years ago. And uh, I was looking, I was doing a project in Sabah and I was looking for um, translation of English to other languages because of the project, which is uh, preparing uh, development plans for Sabah. So I came across KLF and if you like, I got in touch with Rita and then I said, can you do the translation of English to Kadazan, to Dusun and Tatana, which she did really, really well. So we worked, collaborated very well on that. And that's the beauty of this uh, importance of having the foundation in my view, because that means it's recorded as well as it establishes the Kadazan Dusun language in, in a proper way. And we need to look after that. And that's why very, very important. We have something like that established. The other one that I want to put to people before we go on to the next one, I think we might be running over time, but see how it goes, is um, other than what Trans Transri was saying is possibly having a, um, Kadazan Dusun Museum. Um, this is idea, of course, not new. I saw one in, in um, Korea, South Korea, when I was there. And it's about the Korean people. And they have an, an actual three, four story building about the Korean people. And I'm thinking we could do something like that, possibly, and, and think about that in, in a bigger way. And then you have a proper place uh, we can let people observe and, and learn about our culture, tradition, and how to perpetuate our language. And um, that's how we should go on, on that basis. Anyway, I'll, I'll pass you over back to um, Hazel, who will introduce one of our own Undunganau. Thank you, Hazel. Thank you, Uncle Boyd. Back to me. Um, yeah, before I, before I start with Sherian, I think I strongly agree with uh, Uncle Uncle Boyd said about uh, about having a museum for our Kadazan because if we lost our identity and everything else, I think that's just it. We will just be will just be some uh, just a, you know a story to to be heard instead of tangible things to be seen and you know. Things like that. I think it's. I think I, I strongly agree uh, on you on that, uh, Uncle Uncle Boyd. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, moving on. I am proudly to, uh, proudly and honored to introduce to you uh, our very own Unduk Nadau Sherry Ann, who is one of the beauty queens. She was crowned Unduk Nadau in May 2016. And her educa educational background uh, is in accounting and finance and has been working with the government of Sabah for many years now. So we, uh, so we have invited her to be in this forum to share, her, to share her work and her experience and achievement being a beauty queen. And her topic is, who am I unduk ngadaw kaamatan? The Undukadao is very imbued with the Kadazan culture tradition, which was kindly highlighted by our Gundahing, Gundahing Blasius Bunjoa earlier on. So, Sherry Ann, please go ahead. Thank you. So, to our moderator. That was a pleasant introduction coming from Hazel. Hopi Bosian, Kumadiozu Saviabi. 
thank you for inviting me to this forum. It's a pleasure to be able to participate and share some of my thoughts and opinion to everyone here. So before I start my session, I would like to introduce a little bit about myself. My name is Sherry and Lao Zhang. I'm a 27-year-old from Penampang, Sabah. I am currently working in the government sector, which is based in Kuala Lumpur. I only moved here last year on 28th of May, actually, so which means I've been working here for exactly one year as of today. So yeah, that's some brief information about me. My topic for today, today's forum is who am I as Unduk Ngadaw Keamakan. So I will start with why I joined the Unduk Ngadaw competition. Uh, frankly speaking, I was never into pageantry nor modeling. Hence, I never really looked forward to uh, joining Unduk Ngadaw in the first place. Part of the reasons were because I had social anxiety, I had major stage fright. I wasn't that comfortable being in front of people. Ever since I was young, in kindergarten up to secondary schools, I was always labeled as this shy girl. If you, if you ask me back then, I was um, not the kind of person that will talk to people first or make friends in any events or occasions or during any presentations in schools. I would not be the one will be doing the talking in front. Instead, I'll be the one who does every job behind the scenes. I remember during some um, press interview I did in 2016, I told everyone the same thing. I was actually joined Ngadaw um, twice in 2013 and 2015, but I managed to get away from it because I didn't think I was ready at all at that time. I watched every contestant from the year my sister first joined in 2012 and to the second time she joined in 2014. I'm not going to lie, I do wish I had that self-confidence back then. When I watch every girl on stage, uh, it's so well presenting themselves. So uh, in 2016, I decided to give it a try after getting encouragement from my parents, my family, and my friends. They really just uh, wanted me to experience it myself because who knows it could actually change me. And honestly, it did. Not in any bad ways at all, but I received so many positive outcomes. So yeah, my main reason was uh, merely to improve myself, to be out in the public, to meet new people, just try to challenge myself and be out of my comfort zone. It took me some time to actually go for it, but I'm glad that I did. And I finally joined the Unduk Nada competition in 2016, and I represented my hometown Penampang, and by God's grace, I was able to bring home the title of Unduk Nada Kamatan Sabah. So if you ask me, um, with whether it's a good experience, I would say becoming an Indukada was definitely a good experience for me. Up until today, I still do think that my experience in Indukada plays a major part in shaping me into the person I am today. Being part of Indukada has taught me a lot of things, uh, like things that would actually prove useful in my future endeavors. Not only that, um, I learned the art of humility and elegance. I also realized the importance of self-confidence and also having cultural knowledge. And honestly, there wasn't a slight regret at all. Like I said before, I joined Mundo in 2016, merely to overcome my fear and improve myself, especially my communication skills, but then after some time, I realized that this competition is not just about gaining your self-confidence, but also to see the real beauty of Hundu Nadal and understand the true meaning of it from the history itself. I get to learn more about my own and some other cultural heritage, which includes like the uh, 
detailed information of our indigenous people's traditional costumes, the cuisines, and other unique cultural features that of every ethnic group in Sabah. Um, during my reign as Undung Gadao also, I was invited to a lot of cultural events, which to me were such great experiences because I get to experience firsthand the diverse offerings of cultures and um, artistic expression found in a community. I also get to present myself to the public as an ambassador of Sabah and tell people, especially the foreigners, more about Sabah, our culture, and the indigenous people of Sabah. So through all those uh, cultural events that I attended, I also get to meet new people from different ethnicity in Sabah and get to know the other Lungadao girls, which I am actually still in contact with uh, up until today. So uh, if you ask me whether I recommend people, the other girls to participate in the Lungadao competition, I will definitely recommend girls to participate because I believe that uh, by joining this, it will like for me, it will help girls out there to develop self-confidence and um, self-esteem, especially when uh, you're young. It's good to find yourself and explore your talents, your skills and talents. And this Mundo is a unique beauty contest. Like as we all know, it's different than the other contests that we all know like uh, Miss Universe or Miss World. Lugaro has a more different approach to young girls as it touches more on our cultures. It gives us a more understanding and knowledge about our indigenous heritage, which is very important at this age as we need to preserve our Karazan Dusun, Murutus, or in short KDMR culture and prevent it from extinction in the near future. So, uh, Another thing is, uh, one of the benefits of joining Undogado competition is to me learning about self-worth. It encourages young women to look into their inner self and explore their skills and talents like public speaking, for instance. For me, conquering stage fright, I can say, is uh, one of my biggest achievements. The ability to get up in front of an audience has helped me to develop my self-confidence and carry myself with pride. For me, standing in front of a massive crowd and answer questions throughout to me is something I must learn to master my courage and express it with conviction, which eventually also prepares me to conquer other challenges I might face in life. And other than that, by being an Unduk Adao, I get to understand the essence of Unduk Adao itself. I learned that the embodiment of Kiminodun through Unduk Adao serves as a reminder to all the KDMR to uphold the, the noble values of uh, selflessness and wisdom that Kiminodun possess. Uh, holding the title of for the whole year was um, such a, a, a huge responsibility for me because uh, it also taught me actually how to actually manage my time effectively. When I won the title of Undung in 2016, I was actually doing my bachelor's degree in UITM Sarawak. So therefore, I had to travel back and forth during the whole year just to, to execute my duty as Undung Adao. So from that experience, I learned to organize and plan my schedule, schedule properly to make sure I get to fulfill my responsibilities both as a student and also an Undung Adao. Okay, so uh, joining Undung Adao also gave me some life lessons. So one of the life lessons that I've learned is um, to always remain humble, no matter where you are. 
when I won in 2016, my life uh, changed almost 360 degree, I would say, from just an ordinary person to someone that people actually recognize. Um, I remember going to a mall and few people suddenly came up to me and asked, aren't you like, aren't you Sherry and the Udu Nadal? I was stunned because that was something very unusual to me because I rarely talk to strangers. But then when that happened and you know, you just automatically become friendly to people. That is also why I become more socially interactive. When people recognize you, it's always important to acknowledge them and treat them with respect and kindness. Just, um, just don't be arrogant because of the title. Always remember your wood and where you come from. And another lesson, life lesson that I learned is to help others, especially those in need. Uh, the moral tradition of uh, the legend Minodun, as we all know, is about volunteerism, uh, willingness, and sacrificing for the good of others. The most important thing about being an Indukado for me is the responsibility that comes with it, especially me becoming a role model to the young Sabah, to young girls and young men Sabah. To me, um, aside from promoting our cultural heritage, being an Indukado is also a platform for me to help those who are in need. It's more on how I bring myself to the public to represent our people and what I can contribute to the community and how can I preserve the KDMR culture. Uh, since our forum, okay, today is about the revival of indigenous heritage. I think it's important for us to raise an awareness on keeping our indigenous mother tongue back and preventing it from extinction, like everyone say before in this forum. There are, for me, there are actually many ways for a person to learn a language, such as like ours, like mine, Karazan. I myself is honestly not really the fluent in my native language as I use Malay and English as my, my daily spoken languages. But I always listen and speak to those to fluent speakers as it helps me to get used to it uh, as well as practice the language myself. Uh, I also think that it's better if someone start learning a certain language or learn Karazan our native language or any other native language at a very at a young age. I think that, I think parents should um, start conversing with their children in Karazan because as for me I realized that it is harder to learn when you're already a teenager or an adult. There probably a need to enter language classes for that, but then it doesn't matter because and it's not something to be ashamed of when someone doesn't know how to speak in their mother tongue because I believe everything can be learned. It may be hard if we start late, but it's okay as long as we don't stop learning. I think it can also be a lesson to parents nowadays so that they can actually start educating their children starting from now on. This is also very, very important for us to preserve our culture. And like you all said, to prevent the loss of our mother tongue. So I, so yeah, I think that is all for me. I hope my session is fruitful for everyone here. And lastly, I would like to wish Kotavian uh, Tarotagaso uh, Boyd, uh, cousin Boyd, you're mute, muted. Okay, thank you, Sherry Ann. I, I can see you're no, no longer shy and um, very much relaxed in your environment. And I've 
possibly, like you said, it's um, having gone through being an Unukandao has made a difference to your life. I'm sure it, it's the same for everyone that takes part in that. And it, I think that's a wonderful thing to say because it's, it's um, sometimes imbued with something else. But I think for the, for the idea of this is very much about confidence building the way we're going to present ourselves in the future. And it's really great to know that you have done well on that. And we are, I think as, as uh, family and friends, we are very proud of you and what you have achieved. So thank you again for, for that wonderful thing. Now, finally, uh, I, I want to introduce to you, my, this is my pleasure for saying so, Joe Luping. Um, Joe is uh, CEO of the Seung Films. I don't know if you guys have seen some of her movies, but Joe is from Pinampang, and in uh, she lives in New Zealand and Pinampang, as I believe. But she is in Sabah at the moment, and she. I'm reading through some of the accolades that um, I received from online. She studied art at Otago Fine Art University uh, School, and then design and film at Victoria University Wellington, and she is a movie director producer, entrepreneur, and designer. And she she started Joe Looping Design in New Zealand. And if you may come across her designs, there are 2,000 of them. And it's throughout the stores in New Zealand, Australia, and Singapore. So uh, do look out for them because they are quite a, a, a grand label as I saw that on, online. Joe uh, co-founded Seung Films in 2013 to tell the stories of the people of Borneo and on screen, onto the screen. Her topic for today is pres preserving and promoting our indigenous heritage through films. And it's a great topic to me. And it's, um, we're looking forward to how uh, Joe will share all these things. So thank you, Joe, um, over to you. Thank you. Okay, Kodahodan Boyd. And um, it's been a very interesting um, seminar so far. I hope everyone is on the last speaker. So I hope you just wanna shake yourselves and maybe have a little bit of a stretch. Um, I won't be long. Um, it's mostly videos I'm sharing anyway. So here we go. I'm just going to press play from the start. Um, oh, hang on, have I shared screen? Not yet. Um, is that the right one? Which one are you looking at? Uh, Okay, can you see the screen that doesn't have my writing on it? Yes? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, copy Vosian. So thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and thank you very much for this opportunity and the organization of this forum. Um, um, our indigenous heritage culture is very dear to my heart, um, even though I must confess I don't speak Kadazan um, and I do have a broad Kiwi accent, as I've been told, not Australian, but it's Kiwi. Um, so it was really exciting to be able to come back and work with a number of the different people that have been on this panel, Auntie Rita, the Simbang specifically, um, on some of our projects. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, oh, I'm sharing the wrong screen. Sorry, hang on. Can you do a little bit of tech support, tech, tech support here? Okay, can you see, is that the right screen? You still see your notes. <laughs> you still mm -hmm. see my notes, okay. Now do you see my notes? No. Oh, that's good, okay. Yes, a good one. Mm. Phew, thank you. Okay, so I grew up listening to stories. Um, that's me as an eight-year-old wearing my Kadazan costume. Um, and I was really, um, really influenced by my father, Tansri Herman Luping. Um, he wrote a lot of stories um, that he, he told us a lot of stories when we grew up and he, um, and he always told us about um, the warriors or pangazo. And one of the things that we said was, dad, is there, are there any stories about strong girls? So he would make a story, he made one up about uh, a young girl called Ting Tong and a young girl called Siung who were actually trained as pangazo. So um, 
they were strong, gutsy girls, and I'm really glad that he managed to not just tell us, but he moved on to write these stories for us. He also taught us about the Baboizan, who Auntie Rita has spoken about. Um, and he really told us about the importance of the men and the women, the, the male and female role models, um, who were and the women who were responsible for maintaining balance and harmony between the natural and supernatural realms. Um, so the stories, they taught us about our culture. Um, as I said, it was a culture that valued the role that both men and women play. Um, our female role models are strong and fierce of heart. My mamantua was particularly strong. Um, anybody who had the pleasure of meeting her knew that she, she definitely um, was independent, had an independent spirit and voiced that. Um, and the male role models respected the equal partnership between men and women. So a little bit about me, um, as, as um, has been, um, Boyd has introduced me. Um, I've been working in the creative industry for the past 30 years, film, television, and design. Um, worked on a diverse range of projects, so ranging from um, a documentary about um, Palestinian human rights um, um, and also uh, behind the scenes documentaries for features such as The Lord of the Rings. Um, recently, I've been doing broadcast work here, a magazine lifestyle series for um, RTM. Um, really interesting um, learning about. We wanted to promote Sabahan local heroes. So we went around the different districts and um, got local heroes from culture, from sports, uh, sporting heroes, cultural heroes, culinary heroes. Um, and I worked with um, the incredible Husley Bojali and Amy Dungan on local heroes. I then went on to work with Husley on the health detective. And one of the things we did there was we worked with his mother, um, Nohanida, who told us a lot about the, the food that our ancestors ate and the importance of some of the, the ingredients. Because I always marveled at how old my grandmother and grand, you know, she was, she was in her 80s and she was climbing up um, rambutan trees to get rambutan for us. And I thought, well, how does she manage to stay so healthy? So um, Nohanida told us about um, how we um, used to have eels um, and how that's, and then we, we broke that down and Hasley said, well, that's really incredibly healthy for you. So we, we, we traveled throughout Sabah and we actually talked to a number of the different, um, um, because we're such a multi-ethnic um, state that we wanted to cover um, as many different um, ethnic communities as possible. So we talked to Hakka, we talked to Hokkien, we talked to um, Brunei Malay, to Kadazan, Dusun, um, Murut, Rungus. So um, that will be coming out in RTM in a few months, actually. So stay tuned for that one. There's a good healthy recipes and Hasli um, gives us some exercises as well on that one. Um, we've also, one thing that's dear to my heart is um, the environment, very passionate about that. Um, and we've done some educational material for, for UNICEF and Malaysian schools. And the beauty with animation, um, bringing in the idea about different dialects is that we can use different dialects for animation. So that's something that translates really easily to if we, if we want to have the same animation, we can use, um, you know, more rungus um, and it, it works really easily and well. Well, not easily, but it works well. Um, a few selected corporate um, and NGO and PSAs that we've done in the past. Um, so we returned back in, in, nine, in 2013 um, and we co-founded Siong. Um, and what we really wanted to do was develop a company that makes local stories that we can take um, to a global stage. Um, we believe in diversity and we have a huge number of, of um, ethnic groups and men and women in, in our company. Um, it's only a small company, but we're, we're slowly, slowly building it. Um, and I'm happy to say that some of the interns that have come through have directed now some of their own stories. So that's exciting. Um, and I'll share one with you at the end. Um, So today um, I wanted to share a few of our projects which illustrate how we've used film and animation to promote our indigenous heritage. Um, the first project that I want to touch on is Humunudun. 
Um, it's a short film which we made um, entirely in Kadazan. We worked with Auntie Rita Lasimbang, we worked with Auntie Joanna Katingan, we worked with the KDCA, the KDCA Women's Council, the Kadazan Language Foundation. We wanted to work with as many um, advisors as possible. Um, one thing I would want to point out was that the story was actually um, based on um, one version of Hamunadun. So I know we've had, Lassius has already given a version of Hamunadun, but our one came from my dad and also um, from the KDCA, Dr. Benedict Toppin. So it was quite a different take on the story, but I'm just going to play the short trailer that we made. Oops. Hang on. No. And how is that? How come it's not? That one. Ah, okay, it's all right. So one of the aims, oh, so first of all, um, one of the quick things I wanted to say was that that in our version, it was Kanoingan who sacrificed um, Phnompuan. And in our version, Phnompuan became Humunadun after she was sacrificed. And the first Baboizan was Sumundu. Um, so it was quite a very different version of the, of the version that was um, originally um, Lassius gave. So that's interesting. I, I, one of the questions I have while I'm here is how many different versions are there and are they district based or, or, or um, uh, you know, dialect based? So anyway, that was a question. So of another interest was that Alex who played um, Humanadun was actually an Unduk Nadao and she was um, um, very different looking Unduk Nadao as Humanadun there. Um, and um, this is a little short video about her talking about um, how playing Hamunadun actually revived her interest in the Kadazan culture. Hello, my name is Alexandra Alexander. I played Hamunadun in the Hamunadun film. Working in the Hamunadun film has changed a lot of my initial understanding about Hamunadun herself. I've gained an understanding about her importance amongst the KDM community. There is more to her than her wisdom, beauty, and selflessness. I am also honored to be a part of something that could teach the young minds about our belief, culture, and most importantly, our language. And I think filming is the perfect medium. Absolutely, Alex. Hello. Um, so 
the film's a really collaborative process um, and we forged many friendships and alliances with the cast and crew that we worked with. Um, so not only did the information about our heritage get delivered to the Kadazan Dusuns and the cast and crew, but it was also of great interest to the rest of our multi-ethnic crew. Um, so we were really, really fortunate to have a few key cultural advisors who helped ensure that we told the story accurately as possible. So two of these were part of the cast and that's Jennifer Lasimbang and Bonnie Mossius. But we also had Kadazan language advice from Auntie Rita Lasimbang, who's the CEO, CEO of the KLF and um, huge supporter, thank you. And um, also Kadazan cultural heritage advice from Auntie Joanna Katingan, chair of the KDCA Women's Council. So here's a little video that we did of Auntie Rita. Uh, <laughs> translator, what do you want to remove it? When Joe and Aaron first came to, to see me, I agreed to get on board with the, helping with the movie. It was off to that, Nancy Herman Lupin. So um, and really, Nancy uh, Herman Lupin is one of our elders who is still doing something for the Karazan community. He is uh, such an inspiration. Uh, my hope for this movie is that it will be an impetus, bridge for the younger generations of Karazan to once again cross over to their roots, their language, their cultural identity. Thank you, Auntie Rita, beautifully said. <laughs> um, um, and the next short video is from Auntie Joanna Kutingan. Oops, no, that way. Hello, my name is Joanna Katingan. I'm the KDCA Women Council Chairperson and also the associate producer for the Huminadu movie. I felt strongly that this is about the preservation of our culture, the education of our present generation and also future generation. And most important of all is about empowering uh, women. Also well said. Um, Hello. So if you haven't had a chance to watch Munadun and want to know more, then we'll be releasing the film in time for Kamatan. Um, actually, we screen it every year at Kamatan. Um, and this year, um, we'll be putting it on our Facebook page. It will come up on the 30th of May um, at midnight. Um, but it will also be screened at the KDCA um, Kadazan Cultural Village. So they'll be getting a copy of that. And um, also we'll be um, um, working with KLF. And I, we've, we've got some of the booklets that KLF will have about the, the about Monodun and some of the stories behind it. So um, that will be on for a few days. Um, so we've spoken about the Kadazan flashcard. Um, and one of the passion projects that came out of this project was the development of the first Kadazan language app. And this was funded through the premiere of Pumunadun. And um, the three groups all came together and, and, and really we, um, we managed to fundraise for the first app. Um, and so it was a joint project between Siong Films, Kadazan Language Foundation and the KDCA Women's Council. So we completed phase one and, <clears throat> and really we need to expand and further develop the app. We're ready to, to, to move on. So some of the things that we've been talking about, Tansri, um, Bernard Dompok has been saying we need me new media, new new ways of reaching the youth, not just the youth, oldies like myself um, want to be able to learn the language and really media, um, mediums such as apps and, and language apps are, are, are really, I think it's the way forward, um, as well as the books, because from the books that KLF are already doing, we will um, digitize them and um, get it ready for people to be able to use. Um, so I've just I've just come to the end of it actually, but I, before I go, I wanted to give a quick shout out to my auntie Molly Looping and cousin Datanesta Sakayan. So uh, they're continuing the family tradition of making um, lehinku and teaching a new generation. So we made a really short video about them and documented their process for future knowledge. Um, and earlier on, I said mentioned that um, Siung's all about. Um, enabling and developing the younger generation. So this one was directed by um, one of our um, team who came in as an intern and, and um, graduated to be a director. So 
if you get a chance, have a look, and it gives you the whole process of how to make lihang pu. Um, so kata huadan, thanks again, um, and thank you for your time. Wow, well, thank you, Done. Joe. That was um, excellent. Um, we have run out of time with this actually, but it, it's such a wonderful number of stories and superb speakers, by the way. Thank you so much and about to you all because it's a, a, a very exciting, very knowledgeable, deep, profound, meaningful list of um, things that you shared, everyone shared, and something that um, we will stay in our minds and we want to learn and know more about all these things. And there's a number of things that people were talking about. I think just, just before that, maybe um, our cousin Richard, is it okay we finish in about six o'clock? Or do you want, can it be further? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, go ahead, um, cousin Boyd, yeah. Okay, thank you. It's, it's, uh, I'll see how it goes, but yeah, I'm talking about a few Q&A later on, but I just want to say there's a few things here mentioned by each speaker and uh, some of the questions can be discussed. Uh, we need not have to go in, in depth, I guess, because I know that we have already run over three three hours on this, but it was such an interesting list of topics and, and imbued with how you guys presented this. And um, so there were a few things that I, um, Gunohin Blasius mentioned. Uh, I can't remember, I think there's a five, five um, questions he, he asked. I don't know whether you can, any of you can remember what he said, but the one that really is sick in my mind and um, I think very strong is what Tansri was saying about the trilingual um, official languages of um, each country, or in this case, for Malaysia. And he's proposing that Kadazan Dusun can be one for Sabah or Malaysia even. So I think it, it's something that we can discuss further at another time possibly, but maybe also discuss a little bit here as we go through. The other one is the creation, as I was suggesting, about the Kadazan Museum. Um, it's something, again, to be discussed, and we can discuss it here a little bit, maybe, and go through some of those things as we go. The other one that I had in mind is, following on from this forum, is potentially we can do a, a symposium on um, this topic in a bigger way and have a bigger audience, maybe not necessarily online, but maybe in a, a local hotel somewhere. And we go through more deeply on what we, we can do for the future of uh, our language. The other one that stuck in my mind um, is what Joe was saying about um, how many different versions of Huminadun, for example. Uh, that's quite an interesting one, because I, I, I know exactly what she's saying, you are saying, Joe, that uh, Tobin Blas is saying about something else, a different name. And this one is uh, a different again. So it's, it's quite interesting. And it's something needs to be explored and to learn a bit more from our ancestors and possibly our um, Bahizan. And you know our Moing, our grand, grandfathers and grandmothers might know a, a little bit more on the stories on that. So we will need to, to um, learn from them and share the stories as we go through and do more research maybe. And I like the idea of the Kadazan apps, Kadazan Sun apps. I, I think that is something that KLF and others can promote even more. And I'll be very happy if my kids or my, my kids in this case can also be all my um, um, nephews and, and, um, and aunties maybe even to learn about these things. So it's, it's something, there's a lot that we can talk about and, and share. So I, I specifically have no major questions other than those that I mentioned about a suggestion. Now, um, this is a time that we can all discuss a bit more before we finish at, I think roughly, let's say in about 6.15, if it's okay with you, everyone, and, and then we go. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here. But for now, um, Ken, I pass it back to you or Richard. Maybe you can you can start with a question or comment, and I'm sure some of you will, will want to say something else as we go through. Thank you, cousin Richard. Okay, wonderful. I'm so grateful 
that we have this, uh, especially during Kamatan. Um, I had um, always wanted to find the answers of how we can preserve our, our language or culture, especially our language, because um, from our language, I think uh, we can um, uh, show our culture. Without our language, um, we are, uh, like Hazel said, we, we, we can't say who we are because uh, without our language, we, we don't have an, an identity and um, hopefully we'll be able to uh, make our language uh, as uh, usable um, in the future. Um, how are we gonna do it? That's a big question. A few uh, ideas uh, that uh, came into mind would be, uh, of course, uh, a, a Kadazan uh, language schooling, uh, which is done uh, by uh, KLF and the help of the Ministry of Education. And I think education is one way we can uh, continue uh, to preserve our language, but to make it uh, mainstream, that's another question. Um, but of course, a lot of uh, people are helping, like the, the film industry and KLF and all the uh, indigenous organizations are helping out. Um, so I just hope we can find a solution and really make this language alive again. Um, but that's, that's it for me. Uh, I don't have any question, but uh, uh, any uh, 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 cousin Boyd, maybe maybe you can read some of the questions uh, on the chat uh, or um, direct uh, or, or open it up to uh, the audiences. Um, uh, what do you think? <laughs> I, I think I will come in while waiting for any more questions. Um, okay. Is that okay, Richard? Just in case yes. it's an, uh, an early. Absolutely. Uh, first yeah. of all. Yeah, first of all, Kotohodan, Kotohodan, not Kot Vina City, Forum Toko, and uh, thank you, Richard. First and foremost, this is a hard work, combination of hard work by Richard, none other, and I'm, I'm, I was hardly involved, and uh, credit to him. If I was a bit tense at the beginning, I do apologize. I just came back from a, a, a very intense a tour. Um, organizing events and it was very very tense and that's I think it was tense at the beginning because of the slides the technical problem so I do apologize but um, one thing comment I want to make I've been studying the revival of the Hebrew language um, and there's one person that did that is Ben Yehuda if we study his effort he practically revived the, the Hebrew it was dead it was just a ritual language he insisted um, his son to speak the language they speak nothing else in the house. And then the son was the first Hebrew speaker, modern Hebrew. And then from there, it become uh, the national language of Israel. Very, very, very powerful story to, uh, to study and emulate. I've been studying that. And the point there is that it is only successful because the language was usable and important. The state of Israel make it very um, uh, mandatory, so to speak, or even very, very. They, he had to add a lot of terms from other, from other, from other sources to make the Hebrew language modern. Very good to study that by Ben Yehuda. I studied that and I said, "Wow, the parallel of this." So we can try to revive and do all this, but if the language is not usable or is not important in a modern world people still will not use it. So I think that's the biggest uh, thing I learned. But other than that, I leave it to others if there are any more questions, and then I'll just wrap up at the end uh, if I have to. Anybody else? If not, we can wrap up, uh, Boyd. Yeah, there was a no comment. Um, yeah, Benita, please. Yeah. No comment. Uh, not comment, but um, an idea, actually. Um, I'm very happy that there is a flashcard nowadays in, in Google that, that uh, whatever that there's some words in uh, Kadazan words that we Google we can find in the Google right now and I'm so happy but uh, if 
if uh, this team of uh, uh, flashcard will expand all the words in Kadazan. It will be very helpful because um, bec uh, when I start learning English, it is through songs. And when I learn, um, when I find words that I cannot understand, I straight away um, um, open the dictionary and they how I learn my English. So when I transform it back to how I think these uh, youngsters nowadays uh, uh, learn how to speak Kadazan. It might can be uh, done like that uh, because uh, our youngsters love to sing. Sabahan love to sing. So when they find one song that is good to hear, I know they want to learn the language, but the, the only thing is that they don't know how to understand the song. So it might help the youngsters, if there is a flashcard, there's a lot of words there, uh, they can Google it up and then they will they can learn uh, the, the language uh, maybe a bit a little bit faster if there is a, a been more words in the flashcard uh, flash flashcard uh, later on from me. Thank you. Mm, thank you, Vanita. It, it's it's um it reminded me of, of something because you saw my son earlier, Archie, nine years old. He sings a lot of Lazan songs because we listen to that quite a lot. And of course, Francis Landom is one of them. And But he, he knows the words, of course, and intonation, and he can change that, but he doesn't understand what it means yet. So it's something that I need to do and my wife need to do on teaching him the meaning of the words or the translation of those. So that, that's a, a good idea. I'm just recalling here this, uh, looking through some of the chat box. Um, and, and yeah, uh, uh, I uh, cousin Boyd, I would like ahead. to add, uh, as, far as, uh, as far as Google Translate, I don't think the Kadazan language is in Google Translate. Every day I, I try to find Google Translate for Kadazan, it's not available. Every other language in the world is available except for Kadazan language. We need to put the Kadazan language in Google Translate. I, I, I've been searching ways to put it, but so far uh, I haven't gotten the solution yet. But yeah, let's try to find a way to put this Kadazan language or Kadazan Dusun or Dusun language into Google Translate. Thank you. <laughs> mm. Okay, that, that sounds good. Okay, I I'll, just want to go back to um, what Tansri was saying about the um, trilingual um, official language. Uh, and anyone would like to um, make suggestions on that? As, um, do you think it's a good idea, bad idea? Is this something that we can um, consider officially and submit it to the government? Anybody would like to um, make a start on making a comment? I always like the silence because nobody wants to say, but Tansri, what do you think? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I still um, get the, what I, was going to be. I think in some ways. Go ahead. Remember, the, uh, the Sabah State Assembly uh, does allow other languages than Malay. The mm. English is allowed. I mean, and uh, I don't think the standing order has been changed. And I think the native language is allowed. But although I don't native language, so it it is it is there, and uh, perhaps um, we can enlarge on these things. But I'm I'm floating an idea which I I find um, thinking about these things and how do you preserve a language? I mean, if it's not in active use, so if we could allow that, that'd be good because um, you see, I think a lot of us are trilingual here. Yeah, we um, learn um, mm. we. We know English, we know Malay, we know Karazan, and um, some even know Chinese, I think. There are four, but so uh, the trilingual is, um, is, 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 is very, very um, doable for, 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 for Malaysia. Because um, you see, that would mean uh, you'll have English, you'll have Malay, you'll have um, either Mandarin or Tamil. And so on, you see. So most Malaysians are actually trilingual. So it's only a matter of trying to see how it can be adopted um, 
to suit uh, Malaysia, you know, uh, probably in universities and all this, because um, there, 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 there was a time when I was um, talking in the, in the federal cabinet, you know, on the question of Allah and all this. So, so um, um, there were some very nasty comments from, I mean, I can talk about this now because it's such a long time ago. colleagues and um, and they, 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 they'll, they'll say um, well why, why do you why do you want to change it because you don't use the language you can use it in your own language you, you said you you use um, can, can, can and, 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 and all. but of course the problem is um, Malay is really a national language and I think um, and that is why the problem is all, all our uh, children are more or less uh, more glued to is Malay and then their own um, the tongue. So that creates that problem. But I said the problem is that the, the question is this: if you don't want a language um, that 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 um, you know, if you have a national language that this allows other people to use certain terms, then that should not be the national language. Then we should have a new oldest language in the world, <laughs> and there would be no problem because uh, there, there's, there's, there's no Allah in Tamil. So that 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 is uh, the, the 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 central issue that I'm looking at, and that um, there's room for people to be encouraged to have three three languages. I mean, it's almost it's almost it's it's, it's almost uh, developed actually, except that how do you fit into a system in a country, and that that's the thing mm -hmm. in in here. Yeah, um, when you talk about language and uh, dying and all this, I mean, there, there are languages that don't die actually, they just change. Um, see the Greek language, for example, I'm told that um, a lot of English words are now getting into the language to such an extent that the Greeks are worried that uh, they may lose the language. What is true is classical Greek is probably getting out of the way, but um, the Greek language is only changing. It's not dying. It's just adopting new words. I mean, if you look at um, Bahasa in the Indonesia, Indonesia, for example, they use a lot of um, words that is not Indonesian, not 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 Malay, not the old, um, uh, not not the, the 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 word in the Nusantara. Hmm. They from. From Holland, even from English and all this. So, a language is something that is that is um, you know, growing. It's not static. So, I think uh, we should we should definitely um, look, look at how how this can be accommodated. And um, to, to my mind, um, the the traditional language will not will not die. I think it will morph into another language. So, it will be it will be uh, contributing to um, a richer Sabah Malay, for example, <laughs> or it becomes uh, probably a language and then it becomes a language of its own. I mean, it's, 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 that, that, that would not be the way I want it to be. And I certainly would like to see the language um, you know, getting, getting stronger and stronger and stronger. So um, I do not lose any hope in this. I, I, today, like what we're discussing today, points to the fact that uh, the language is, is staying its position because the uh, parameters are already in evident, you know, the things that we mentioned about um, availability of all the documents, um, either in films or in the libraries or in the in the social media, and all this, it's all there. It's only for us to now see how we can uh, ensure that all this will point to the same direction of getting the language on its feet um, to be to be the language of, of choice for our children. Yeah. Okay, boy. Dr. Dan Tasri, it, very enlightening, and, and it's something that we need to, to discuss further, in, in my view. And for all of us here, um, the fact that we are still here is, is, is um, very much to do with the fact that we want to learn more. and reading from the comments that I can see here, many of them are saying it's an eye-opener, this, this event. And 
it's about learning something new, something you never is something that's fresh and they never come across. Even for me, being um, I would say a Kadazan from the the other generation, if you like, I'm still learning. There's a lot of things that, that I probably missed and and I need to renew or revive, if you like. And and um, even my Kadazan is not that good anymore. It's imbued with um, other languages because I've having lived in the UK and then come back. Uh, but one thing that I'm really proud of for myself is the fact that when I was in the UK, I wrote to my mom in Kadazan. And it's a, a, a deliberate idea because it's to me um, by doing that, because my mom um, speaks English, but she prefers in Kadazan. So that's why I, I wrote to her in Kadazan and she replies in Kadazan. Those were the days of no emails. And, and things like that. So I, I write to her literally, and it's pages and pages of writing, but it's good for me. Not my mom can speak superb lesson. It's good for me to, to ensure that I can understand, speak, and write lesson. So today, years and years later, 40 years plus later, I'm very proud that I can I can write in Kadazan, more or less. And, and I can speak it in, in, a, in a good way, and I can understand. Just referring to what Venita was saying about um, when you are in another country, like some of us do, I guess I can see some from Russia and, and in America and other places. When you are there, it's at the pot Benavadi, Venita. It's, it, when you hear somebody speaking in Karazan, you gravitate to that very quickly because the first thing you see is, you feel is a connection to that person. You know that that person comes from Sabah. It didn't come from anywhere else. If they speak a lesson, you know that that person is from Sabah. And that, that's your start. And you, you immediately start a conversation. And although I'm based in um, Johor at the moment, I know if that person is from Sabah, the way they speak. They are Malayu. And you know which part from Sabah too. Yeah. You know which so part from Sabah. <laughs> it's that kind of thing. Yeah. It's, a, it's you, you really understand and it's, when you go there and you go, oh, and then they, you start a conversation. The other person feels the same. They will feel like, wow, there's a connection here. And if it's any part of the world, whether you're talking about Russia just now or Vancouver or another part of Europe, as soon as you hear that language, our language, and I totally agree with your, your uh, lyrics, uh, Venita, it's how you feel. And then you immediately have an understanding and a connection wherever you are in the world. So this is something that we need to keep and we need to preserve, not only preserve, but speak it every day and, and um, make our kids understand. And uh, maybe come to a point where we need to literally speak all the time with that language so we don't lose it. My, my mom speak to my son in Kadazan and they have this um, WhatsApp conversation they speak to each other in, in they reply to each other in the microphone in Kadazan. So it, it's a good thing again. It's that kind of very small, but it's good for my boy to, to, to know and understand. And of course, the Mia Moing also reply the same way. So it's, it's good for us to revive that and keep it intact. And at the same time, making sure that we promote and make it big for ourselves. So there's a lot of things that we can talk about. And I'm sure that some of you, we want to say something. So uh, please go ahead. Uh, Rita, I want to ask you a question because it's your KLF is, is a really, really great idea. And, and thank you Transri for, for um, I think thinking about it in the first place. So it, it's something that um, I very much uh, admire and, and I can see how a lot of good work being done on that. And I think you should continue and make it even more. And, but my version is really to say, can we write more, um, preserve obviously those uh, folklore that we have, but at the same time, um, write new books, novels in Karazan. And um, it's not going to be easy, I suppose, but at least with the KLF there, um, I think we can do it. So. Is it something that um, KLF is doing already or planning to do or have done maybe? Thanks. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oi. I think you better tell him to look for sponsors to um, to publish some of the books. <laughs> yeah. So here you go. Um. Yeah. That little uh, presentation that I had a voice over, as you can see, those uh, some of activities we've started, but as uh, Tansri now just uh, said, and even here I see Joe's uh, comment on why the Karazan language app is not in Apple. Yes. And going back to even that Karazan language app was only possible because she was the instrument in, in, in spearheading the uh, fundraising to, to fund that. And then um, uh, what else? So uh, the, the novel writing, yes, that's uh, this time that's the fourth one. And the fifth one is ongoing. But I already told Tansri also that what are we going to do with the, the winning uh, novels, the one, two, three? Uh, we only managed to publish three, uh, three uh, novels, and uh, there are many more. So the issue is all about funding. Uh, yeah, uh, itu lah hoy, money and the fun. So and with all those that you know, the folklore, yes, we, we have started. Also, we are continue doing that. And um, I just to comment also, uh, uh, like uh, Vinita was talking about the flashcards, singing lyrics, actually. Uh, I'm very, very happy that KLF this year, uh, we are involved in uh, for, for Sabah to present, represent Sabah in, in, uh, in being involved in the International Mother Language Day. And they wanted a song in, in Kadazan. And all the time I've uh, spoken to Venita that your song that should encourage people to, to speak Kadazan. And so that was an opportunity how, how it got the English translation yeah, it was just Kadazan, kan? So yeah. this, thank uh, you for the translation, uh, <laughs> So that was one way, la. I mean, we're talking about learning Kadazan, learning. You know, maybe you understand if it's just Kadazan, you Kadazan, but maybe people are interested to know what that means. So uh, that was an effort, la, to for for that song, and because it was um, for the International Mother Language Day, where it's an international audience, so we stick in the Karazan and hence that's why we have the Karazan a subtitle to that beautiful song. So mm -hmm. conclude all oh boy we have tried A to Z. You've seen the little presentation that had a voiceover and all the, the main thing here is we need to do something about it. Yes, but we also need to do something about looking for the funding. So you guys at international level, uh Tobinai Richard, you uh Tobinai um um can okay so we have said our piece our need not just our wants uh, our need thank you ah uh, yeah um i uh, cousin boyd um looks like uh, we have another speaker here who wants to talk uh gundohing blasius binjua okay thank you thank you tabuna richard it's me again. I just want to say a few words. Uh, number one is uh, in the old days, there was no uh, Sepang Airport. There was only the old Subang Airport. After finishing uh, UMS, my daughter and her soon friend from somewhere in Tambunan, Okinawa. And they ventured into Kuala Lumpur in search for employment. And uh, these two young ladies, fresh from school, UMS, they tried to apply a few jobs. And there was one time they applied for a job, customer services at Hayat Sojana, which is the nearest to Subang Airport in the old days. So they were excited and uh, they attended the interview. After a few uh, courtesies and uh, introduction that they are from Sabah, and they proudly announced that they are Dusun from uh, Tambunan, I think. And my daughter is, of course, from Pinampang, and she said, yes, I am Karazan. So here comes the surprise. 
the interviewer, the human resources manager of Hyatt Sojana in Subang. Well, ladies, I'm very happy that finally I have found Kadazan and Dusun, natives of uh, Sabah, who can work in my hotel. And each time these ministers, these VIPs, these uh, businessmen, these uh, customers, guests from coming from Sabah, and if they see you, people at the front line office, front office, they'll be very comfortable in arriving at the right hotel, i.e. Hyatt Sojana. So can you tell me, that's the interviewer, can you please tell me, how do you speak in Kadazan or in uh, Dusun? So they had a shock, they panic. Fortunately, my daughter had this uh, religious instruction during Sunday school. She memorized, she committed to memory, the one uh, very important prayer, regular prayer in the church, which is Tamaza. So they look at it, uh, each other, and then uh, my daughter pretended to be talking to her friend. So she said, Tamaza de surga pentang rangan u koi kodak pemerintah nu kandak nu ada di dalam tanah mega de surga. Amen. Wow. The human resource manager of Hyatt Sojana was very impressed. They were asked to report to for duty the following week. So that's why they were working in Hyatt Sojana. That's one. If there is a value to the language, commercial value at least, commercial value at least, people will pick up this language, no problem. They will value this language. They love the mother tongue, whatever the mother tongue is. And by doing so, if let's say the government of Sabah say, if you want to work with us in the government service, Please be able to speak Dusun, Murut, Rungus, Latud, or Kadazan as a basic requirement. Why not the entire Kadazan community, all the natives in Sabah, will pick up Kadazan immediately, overnight? There will be a big search for demand for books in Kadazan and also the teaching of Kadazan. They want to go to the university and study the word Kadazan. But as it is now, if you are a graduate in Kadazan, where can you seek employment? Where mm. is the labor market for? If you are a graduate in Kadazan, you specialize in the language. The best you can do is a translator in RTM and probably in the newspaper. And of course, in the teaching profession. So that much I want to say. There are a lot of things that have uh, come to my head, but reserve it for other forums. Thank you very much. Patuhodan. Thank you, Tabinai. I, I like that. I think I will keep that one, the idea of the Tamuzai Surga. Um, it might work well one day. It, you never know. It, it, it's something that's very interesting, but you're right. It could be, make a difference to getting a job or not. Uh, the way I see it. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I think we've really gone overboard now, but it, it's such an interesting, and we're just getting into it. But um, any other comments so far before before we wrap up? All right, I think we, we've... Um, um, a lot more to say, I'm sure, but um, let's leave that for another time. I, we've taken on board many of the speakers' um, comments and suggestions. Some of this, I think we can, we can follow up. Uh, the funding part, I, I, it's something that we are very keen on and looking. So possibly Rita will and Benita will, will look into that. It's one of the areas that we are really keen on doing because it, it helps us on this bigger theme about Borneo and how we can fund projects through getting them from somewhere. Um, we will look into that and definitely we'll come back. As always, we follow up this and um, come back to you and, and give some ideas of how we are progressing. And of course, it's a two-way system. 
we will try to help and your side will need to come up with the goods, let's say, of could be information, it could be some detailed um, publicly available documents like that. So we can really learn from that. By the way, I just want to say that when I work in what's called Iskandar Malaysia in Johor, and oftentimes I actually speak three languages in one go when I present. Sometimes in Kalazan, or I have Kalazan in there, one or two, English and Malay. And my friends in West Malaysia always say, what is that language, that one? And it, it's a kind of thing where it's, um, sometimes I do it deliberately just to show that I know that. So I explain it to them and it's good. One of the earlier ones that I keep saying, and we all say is Tobinai. If you are Peninsula, you don't know what that is. If you are Sabahan, you will know. So I, I do that and they speak to, they always address me in that way now, which, which is great because it means that there is a commonality between, between us. So it's good because Tobinai is a, a soft word. It's a very polite word, isn't it? And it's something that I use quite a lot in uh, presentations, whether it's international, local, I do that. And it's, it's good because it's for me, it's, it's, I just feel proud of saying that and the other words that, that come along because it applies to both male and female. So wonderful things to, to have. Anyway, just want to say from my part, thank you so much for staying this uh, late with us. Um, at some point, we will also talk about it in another forum. As I said, this is a monthly forum, so there will always be a topic. And if you guys have some ideas um, you want to share, basically, so that we can, we can share it and then um, talk about it and then discuss it and have a forum with it. At, at some stage. So I'm not going to say any more on this. Um, perhaps it, Hazel, do you want to say any more before I pass it to um, Ken? Uh, Hazel has uh, gone to her job. So okay. you, All right. uh, yeah. Okay, okay. My, my friend Ken, can you, can you go ahead please before we wrap up? Uh, Thank you. Top nine, but I can call my friend, yeah. Thank you very much. Terima kasih kerana sudi menyertai forum kami. Saya tidak telah menerangkan objektif Borneo Forum iaitu untuk mengerat hubungan, eratkan hubungan antara semua orang Borneo dari segi ekonomi, dari segi sosial dan juga dari segi um, um, pembelajaran education, uh, cultural. Uh, bukan sebuah uh, organisasi politik. So, thank you. Terima kasih. Kota Wadan, Sawiawi. And uh, happy Saturday. <laughs> Kota Wadan, Kota Wadan. Okay. Thank Wadan. you very much. Terima kasih. 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 Thank you, Rita, Joe. Thank you so much, Sharon. Bye. One, two.